Apologies, please, Julie. Thank you, Provost, and good morning, members. Provost Jim Todd. Yeah. Councillor Stephen Canning. Here. Councillor Ellen Friel. Yes, I'm here. Thank you. Councillor John McFadden. Councillor McFadden, yeah, I can see you online. Councillor John McGee. Yeah. Councillor Elaine Cowan. Here. Councillor Maury Mackay. Present. Councillor David Richardson. Present. Councillor James Adams. I have an apology from Councillor Lillian Jones. Councillor Ian Linton. Yeah. Councillor Douglas Reid. Yeah. Councillor Graham Barton. Yeah. Councillor Graham Boyd. Present, Julie. Thank you. Councillor Barry Douglas. Yeah. Councillor Neil Ingram. Yeah. Councillor Peter Mabin. Yeah. Councillor Claire Maitland. Here. Councillor Beverly Clark. Here. Councillor Sally Cogley. Here. Councillor Kevin McGregor. Here, thanks. Councillor Linda Holland. Here, thanks. Deputy Provost Claire Leach. Here, Julie, bye. Thank you. Councillor William, William Lennox. Morning, here. Councillor Alison Simmons. Here. Councillor Billy Crawford. Yeah. Councillor June Kyle. Present. Councillor Jim McMahon. Yeah, Julie, thanks. Councillor Neil Watts. Present. Councillor Drew Filson. Councillor Jennifer Hogg. Councillor Elaine Stewart. Here, Julie, thanks. Thank you. And just a double check, Councillor Filson. Great, thank you. Thanks, Provost. Thanks, Julie. <laughs> Uh, before we get into the business, folks, uh, we'd just like to welcome uh, a couple of corporate support graduate interns, and that's Amy Fraser and Charlotte Steele are sitting up the back. So welcome to proceedings. I hope you find it very interesting. And we've got Laurie, who's a student journal. Laurie's online. Hi, Laurie. Welcome to the meeting. OK, great. Thanks, folks. Now, in terms of um, the business today, I'm going to propose that after item five on your papers, we're going to introduce an additional item. Uh, it was at the meeting of Cabinet yesterday, it was agreed to defer the report on the review of school meal payments to the meeting of Council this morning. Uh, can we have an agreement that will take this additional item after item five? Thank you. Uh, I would also like to welcome the non-elected members of Cabinet who have been invited to join the meeting for this item. That's part of the educational uh, side because it affects education. And that's why those members are invited. But that'll be after item five. OK, folks, uh, just some remarks very quickly. I can just say that on the 27th, uh, uh, the 31st of October, it was a pleasure to accompany the Minister for Drugs Policy, Angela Constance, on the walk for hope. And that was for one thing all the way down to the Howard Park. And this was to raise aware awareness for recovery for those with addictions. Uh, it was a lovely rose of remembrance ceremony uh, with stalls, children's activities and refreshments. And it was good to see folk uh, talking about their experiences and how they have managed to overcome uh, some serious addictions. Gargison Primary School on the 2nd of September. Um, it was a, a delight to present Anaya Rana with a certificate. Anaya was a winner of the primary schools category in the Robert Burns World Federation Art Competition. And it was lovely to hear the, all the pupils reciting Burns poems. The world president of the Robert Burns World Federation, Mr. Henry Kearney, was over from Canada and he had a, a lovely day and we showed him around East Ayrshire and the Dean Castle. He was delighted. It was an honour to go to Edinburgh to celebrate the 75th years of India's independence at the Usher Hall. It was a lovely evening and um, all the entertainers took us through the history of India uh, through dance and music and word and uh, a lovely evening. We had a great time there. Shrek the Musical, the Loud Musical Society at the Palace Theatre, uh, a wonderful evening, uh, a great show full of colour and all the children really enjoyed that. Uh, we were all at the official opening of Lonehead Primary School on the 5th of October. Great to see this great old school from 1905, part of Andrew Carnegie's uh, benevolence, 
uh, helped to build that school and it was great. Uh, I know that the leader was there uh, with some great old memories of the time he was there. I think we even found his desk. Um, and a, a wonderful occasion on 8th of October, uh, the African Gateway event at the Grange Academy. Uh, our chief, uh, Farouk Hussein, had welcomed uh, all of the Afro-Caribbean uh, members of our community, who number over 70 adults and around 30 children. So it was a great day about uh, information, knowledge gaining, uh, and tried some of the food. And uh, I know that Alia and the team here are working very closely with that group to make them a semi-formal organisation. So it'd be great to welcome them on an official basis. Holford Age Concern, uh, 50th anniversary, Wednesday the 12th. It was great to be there with some entertainment and talk to some, uh, I was going to say old faces, talk to some great old mature faces that knew uh, for a long time, me and Barry were at that. Recognition for the Ayrshire Roads Alliance. Uh, this was through Transport Scotland, Police Scotland, Glasgow City Council, Foreign Commonwealth Office, all in partnership working to deliver the transport management for COP26. It was a complex, challenging period and uh, everything seemed to go uh, uh, very well. So well done to Kevin Braidwood and the team who have been recognised for their work uh, on that uh, weekend. Scots Language Teacher of the Year Award. Uh, Amanda Dunn from Shortley's Primary School picked up the Scots Language Teacher of the Year Award at the National Scots Language Awards in Dundee. The awards were founded in 2019 by Hands Up for Traditional Scotland's Traditional Culture, Music and Arts. And um, the Scots language is a great old uh, way of speaking. And uh, there's some, a few favourites of mine that I'll not say here, uh, but they're very descriptive. So a great well done and congratulations to Amanda putting short leaves on the map. At Kay's Curling Stones in Mockland, the 20th of October, uh, went along and met Princess Anne. Uh, who had a great time going around and seeing all of the old machinery, some of it a couple of hundred years old, that's used to um, transitional, uh, to transform uh, the stones from uh, the lava, as you know, out in uh, Ailsa Craig or Paddy's Milestone, as we call it, um, into the premium world-class curling stones that you see on the telly. So they've been doing it since 1851, and they've used granite from Ailsa Craig ever since. So a massive well done to them. Uh, thanks, folks. And we're getting into business now. And that is the declarations of interest. If there are any declarations, uh, please state now. I don't think there are any with the business that we're uh, going to conduct today. But we're OK with that. And with that, I'm going to uh, open up the item two, which is uh, the previous minutes. And I would propose the previous minutes of council as correct record. Second provost. We've got deputy provost there. Thank you very much. Any questions, folks? Thank you. Uh, we're going to go into the cabinet and committee minutes, and uh, I'll look to uh, the leader to propose on block. Could I move as a correct record on block, provost? Thank you. Provost, if I can pick up on 3.9 on those of the Cabinet meeting the 7th of September. And the matter arising for that is the population of the Member Officer Working Group and Women's Health. Uh, could I make a proposal, please, that I populate it 3, 1 and 1, please? Please from SNP Group 1 for the other two groups, please. Second, Provost. That's for the Member Officer Working Group for Women's Health. Had a proposal from the Deputy Leader um, are there any other proposals? We're okay. Are you ready, uh, Deputy Leader, to populate? I'd like to propose uh, Claire Maitland, uh, Beverly Clark, and Stephen Canning. Thank you. Uh, the other groups, are you ready yet? Or do you want to populate a later date? Yep, it's okay. Later date, please. Yep, thanks, John. Yep. Um, could the names come to myself, please? Thank you. Thanks for that. Um, we need a seconder for the cabinet minutes. Deputy Leader. Yep. Thank you. We're going to open it up now for questions uh, for the cabinet committee minutes. Councillor Mackay. Chair, I was about 
ask about the uh, meeting. You've taken the council meeting of the 25th of August, the council meeting of the 22nd of September. We're both moved and seconded. Oh, I'm, I'm sorry, I, I missed that. My apologies. Sorry. Sorry, Provis. Thanks for that. Thank you. Um, any other? Uh... See, I'm lost now, Maureen. Okay. Right, any other uh, questions, comments on the Cabinet Committee papers? You're good. Councillor Mackay. Thank you very much, Chair. Uh, on page 58, which is Cabinet on Wednesday, the 25th of September, when we uh, had our initial response to the cost of living crisis. Uh, off the back of that, Chair, and I know uh, Deputy Leader uh, Councillor McMahon and myself were part of the members and there are others in this chamber today who were fortunate enough to be at the presentation that was given uh, in the Park Hotel uh, by the organisations who had undertaken an exceedingly wide ranging survey, which was on the extent and the impact of COVID. What I would like to do, uh, and I hope that I have people there that will support this as well, is I would like to formally make reference to that study today to again inform and support some of the work and the understanding that we are doing in relation to that cost of living crisis. If you can indulge me just for a second, uh, Chair, uh, it was the East Ayrshire COVID Resilience Research Report and again, uh, it the consortia who pulled that one together were the New Cumnock Development Trust, East Ayrshire CVO, Yip World based in Cumnock, Auchin Lake Community Development Initiative, the Zone in Dalmellington and the Sky Project, which you'll be well aware of. My understanding is that there were over 2,500 face-to-face interviews uh, undertaken and there is an extensive report which I would like to ensure was circulated across all members, really just as background information to uh, support members thinking uh, across this matter. Just on very, very high levels, what uh, it was felt in the executive summary was that they wanted to address a cross-sector East Ayrshire task force being set up. Again, I think that's very much in line with things that we will look at today in the paper. A local authority economic uh, reco COVID recovery fund. Again, I think that's very much looking at what we're already agreeing to. Also looking at health agencies coming together to consider how to improve access uh, mental health services and a collaborative approach and very much saying that working families who have limited disposable income are now struggling with the cost of living crisis. So exactly uh, provost what we know. Elderly and people with long term limiting health conditions are most impacted. People who are unemployed or underemployed, single occupancy households and lone parents. It's not in any way to change any of the actions that we're doing. It is merely to supplement that. And I think it will be beneficial reading for all members and officers. So I would like to ask that that could be circulated around. Thank you, Provost. Okay. Uh, I've got the leader on and then Deputy Leader. Thanks, Provost. I might raise another item, but I'll come back to that. Um, just, but in terms of uh, Councillor Mackay's proposal, uh, I think there's a lot of sense in doing that and making you know, these matters as informative and as much information as we can get to people. Uh, you know, I think it's been an excellent exercise, and there's been some really leading work been taken in the in this area. So I think that would be helpful. So I would support that proposal. But I've got something else on another topic to come back in. Promise. Yeah, leader, go. 
I don't know if Jim, Jim McMahon was wanting to speak to the uh, proposal for Maureen. That's a bit of a separate issue. Yeah, Deputy Leader, yeah, OK. Thanks, thanks, Provost. Uh, thanks, Maureen, for, for bringing that up. And you're, you're right to highlight all the points again. I think that, that survey that, that was participated with all the, the, the groups that were mentioned recognised right up at top level at Scottish Government for the detail it provided. I've uh, uh, previously spoken to the Chief Exec and asked him not only to pr provide that information, but I think uh, in recognition of their work, I uh, should present that to members in the chamber. We were hoping that mere members could turn up on the Saturday morning at the park, Hotel, but unfortunately, uh, other commitments uh, pay to that. So I'd, I'd extend that again openly uh, to the Chief Exec to invite them in to do that presentation. I know the figures have probably moved on a bit for them, but they're really relevant for what we're, what we're going through, or relative to what we're going through over the course of living. Well, that's great. I see uh, Doogie, Katie's got her hand up, uh, if it's relating to that item. Katie? Yeah, thanks very much. Just very briefly, Chair, just to, to let um, Councillor Mackay and others know that um, Craig MacArthur has requested a, a meeting with the colleagues who put that work together, and we will be meeting with them to look to see how we can align it with our approach and, of course, further engage with members so that we make sure that we're reflecting everything that, that, that we're hearing from our communities and that we tie that in. So that's very much in hand. We're just waiting for a, a date back for that meeting to take place and we'll go through it line by line and then tie it into the work that we're leading around cost of living. Thank you, Chair. Oh, thanks. That's a good idea. We'll ensure that that uh, happens um, and we'll get all that information out to the members. Thank you. Uh, Leader. Thanks. It's, it's in relation to item three and page 43 of the Police and Fire and Rescue Committee. Uh, just in relation to the spotlight session, that is social behaviour in Kilmarnock Town Centre. Now, I'm, I'm not really wanting to speak in much more depth than there already has been, you know, uh, but, you know, I know that this is a, some of the safety issues and some of the concerns for business uh, is really important and we really need to address, you know, some of the re recent incidents that have you know, given uh, a bit of reputational damage to the town. But, you know, I think uh, there's a lot of good things going on in the town as well, and uh, we, sh we shouldn't forget that. So uh, one of the things, you know, for example, this week, it couldn't happen, you know, some of these issues where the, the cameras were spotlighting some of these negative issues about Kilmarnock, where we've got one, you know, we've got really, I've, I've got the poster here, Elaine, for the Halloween Festival, and I would encourage everybody to go along to that. You've got a lot of volunteers, a lot of the churches, uh, pubs and restaurants participating that, showing some of the best aspects of, of Kilmarnock, and there's a real positive story there. But that's not to ignore some of the incidents that's taken place this week. And, you know, I mean, as leader, I will undertake to uh, work and cooperate with all, particularly local members, uh, uh, on, on these issues. We had a very good discussion yesterday uh, with Farouk Hussain, who... who Met with us as a matter of urgency, and I'd like to you know, look at if we can collectively pass on our thanks to him for such a quick response on that matter. But uh, we will look at you know any issues that there are in the town centre that we're given absolute top priority, and I think we really need to work together to resolve some of these. But that, let's not forget some of the positive things that are going on in the town as well. Thanks, thanks, Provost. Uh, thanks, Leader. I'm going to bring the Chief Exec in. Thanks very much, Provost. And just to confirm, following the meeting with the Chief Superintendent with a number of elected members, MSPs and MPs last night, I followed up with further meetings with the Chief Superintendent uh, this morning and very much around, you know, the, the, what the, the leader was saying there about that proper balance, that people need to feel safe in the, the town centre, but also we need to be a, a very clear, you know, about the good things that are on in the town centre and what's perceptions and what's reality are, are some of the things we need to do. And, you know, I think, you know, people who attended, you know, yesterday can see the level of depth of partnership working that the Chief Superintendent was saying is likely the best he's ever experienced in his, his life, you know, coming working here. And he's got many colleagues who come and, and see how we do that. So we will continue to work with Police Scotland and all our other partners in terms of making sure our communities not only feel safe, but are safe in the town centre. Uh, thanks, Eddie. Councillor Boyd. Just following on for that, um, 
Tomorrow night is the biggest Friday in Kilmarnock, so we're hoping it's really safe. On a positive note, Celebrate Kilmarnock's got a lot of great events. And you maybe saw my email yesterday, we're still looking for volunteers for props. So if anybody's got free time tomorrow afternoon, late on in the evening, give me a wee shout and we'll find something for you to do. I'm uh, busy up at Kilmarnock uh, for a Halloween thing, but we'll try and come down, Graham. Scare the wains. Uh, Members, any further uh, comments on the Cabinet Committee minutes? Can't see any on screen. Leader, you've got, is that a legacy? Yeah. Are we okay? Thanks, folks. We're going to move on to item four. And this is the Council Strategic Framework, pages 70 to 234. And I'm going to ask Eddie to introduce it, but then we're going to Pauline uh, Minnery, then Julie Jamison, Donna Nielsen and Paul Toland. Uh, Pauline will speak to the strategic plan. Julie will speak to the medium-term financial strategy. Donna will speak to the workforce strategy. And then Paul will speak to the digital strategy. And I'm going to propose that after each report, uh, we'll take questions then. Is that OK? Thank you. Over, Eddie. Thanks, Provost. Uh, members will recall that on the 29th of June, we brought forward a draft strategic plan uh, to Council for endorsement, you know, to look forward for the session uh, of, of Council about what the strategic priorities of the Council were. At that time, after it was agreed, we agreed we would come back with a more detailed action plan uh, that, that was asked for by members so they could see how does the actual activity that goes on within the Council feed towards the priorities? And you'll see that coming back to us there. But that can only be delivered if we've got a clarity around what our financial envelope is to deliver that, what our workforce you know, is to deliver that, and also around what our future digital strategy is eh, for that. The other part of that that clearly is our capital plan, and that's not here with us, but that's reviewed every February, and the implications of the reports here today will feed into that review, and you can see a, a specific recommendation eh, on that and how the capital plan eh, fits together. Provost also said, you know, the officers that will present the reports today, all of these reports have been drawn together for lots of officers across the council. What you have presenting are the lead officers who have actually done that and drawn it together. And it's important that we hear for them and how you know that they've been able to do that. We understand that these set, you know, for us over the next five years, over the term of the council, a direction of travel. And for that, it's really important for us that we hear from elected members. This is always for us saying to you, here's what we've listened, here's what we're testing out, and we want to hear back from elected members to give us assurance that that's what we're doing, and for us then to give that assurance back to you on a regular basis about the progress we're making uh, in terms of, of that. So with that promise, I don't want to say much more, and look, rather than that, just pass on to uh, our colleagues. Thanks very much, Eddie. I'm going to hand over to Pauline now. Good morning, members, and my thanks to Provost Todd and Chief Executive for their introductions. As the Chief Executive said, when we brought the strategic plan to Council back in June, it was with the intention of getting agreement for the six themes that we'd identified, along with the priorities associated with those themes, and we committed to come back to you with a detailed action plan. Over the last few weeks, we've been working on developing that action plan, using the breadth of content that's available within the wide range of Council strategies and policies, and also the report and frameworks that we have in place across Council services. There were a number of different ways that we could have presented this information. However, there were some underlying principles that we wanted to make sure that we took account of as we were doing this. Firstly, the strategic plan provides a bridge between the East Yorkshire Community Plan and also our Council services. And so we wanted to ensure that we demonstrated as succinctly as possible the wide range of good work that's taken place within and across services. Taking account of external audit, fe external audit feedback, we also wanted to ensure that we could demonstrate alignment between and across our key plans and strategies. We wanted to ensure that we could measure benefits and that we could show a clear focus on arrangements for supporting, monitoring and delivering on all of our expected outcomes. We also wanted to show that transformation is embedded within the work of the Council through things like service redesign, our budget processes, uh, various projects and other activities. And also that the strategic plan is aligned with the other strategies put before you today. So the financial strategy, the workforce strategy and the digital strategy. On page 86 of your papers, you'll see that we provided details of how each of our strategic plan themes link to the community plan, to the national performance framework and also to the UN sustainable development goals. 
The pages that follow from page 87 through to page 119 are then split into six sections, with each section representing one of the key themes of the strategic plan. The themes and priorities that we've identified take account of the community plan we share with our partners, and they also build on the work of our previous two transformation strategies, as well as the COVID-19 Recovery and Renewal Action Plan. We also take account of the feedback that we had from communities, local and national context, and drivers for change, along with various risks, challenges and opportunities, and all of that information was set out within the report that we brought to you back in June. For each theme, we've produced a table detailing the priorities for that theme, along with some of the actions which we consider have the potential to make the biggest impact towards the priorities that we want to achieve. We've also included details of a CMT sponsor for each priority, time scales, anticipated benefits, and a column which contains a red, amber, green indicator of progress. As a starting point, most of these have been flagged as green at the moment, but as we look at these in much more detail in the weeks and months ahead, we'll uh, further develop those action plans and we'll seek to refine timescales and benefits. We'll also be able to provide clear updates on how actions are progressing and how they link to performance in future reports. So for each theme, you'll see that we've also pulled together a selection of key high-level performance indicators, uh, ensuring links with our other performance frameworks. So things like the Local Outcomes Improvement Plan, the Local Government Benchmarking Framework, Statutes for PIs, the Scottish Household Survey, Scottish Public Health, and National Records for Scotland. And we've tried to show the sources throughout that document so you can see where that information is coming from. Services will also have their own suites of performance indicators, ensuring that we have clear performance and impact measures at each level of planning within the Council. At the moment, we've built in three years of performance information along with Scottish averages, and we'll now be looking to refine and better define the targets against each of those indicators. At the moment, you'll see a lot of them are kind of increase or decrease, but we'll look to put figures against those as we move forward and build in some of the detail. We've also built in red, amber, green reporting again, and this will become even more important as we define those targets that I just mentioned. For a number of the indicators that are reported, we'll also have information available at a local level. And while the ones that indicated here are intended to give a high level direction, it'll be really important that we also take account of that locality information as well and look at the differences between our communities. What I would want to take the opportunity to say at this stage is that the indicators aren't set in stone. So if there are other measures that you would want, you would find it helpful to see reported or that would give you added assurance, then we'll be very happy to add these and to include them in future updates that we'll bring back to you. Finally, at the end of each section, we've included reference to, along with links, to the key enabling strategies and policies that have informed the development of the tables within the document and will support the achievement of the priorities that we've detailed. Within those strategies, there's a plethora of other actions that will be contributing towards the achievement of the priorities and themes that we've outlined. For example, this will include our service improvement plans, uh, which will now be updated to take account of the papers that we're considering today, and to um, take account of other strategies such as health and social care partnership, climate change, children, young people's uh, strategy, all of which have informed the, the document before you. Many of the priorities and activities presented throughout the action plan are interconnected and there will be multiple and complex factors that will influence performance. For example, we've described within paragraph 22 of the covering report that we have a range of activities that are uh, detailed within building a fairer economy, which aim to support local businesses and to create more and better paid jobs. So in doing so, we would anticipate that would increase employment, decrease unemployment, um, lead to reductions in the number of people living in poverty and through time improvements in things like wellbeing and quality of life creating better opportunities for people and ultimately reducing demand on council services. But how we capture that cause and effect and how we reflect connections is quite complex and we're at the early stages of developing those approaches at the moment. Um, but we will be working with services towards building in a benefits realisation approach to their work at a much earlier stage that will let us to set those targets and look at how we monitor them through a project. Throughout the strategic plan, there are also a number of work streams linked to the other strategies being presented today that will support wider transformational change within the Council. So these include things like the cost of living, uh, digital, including driving improvements and the use of data and analytics across Council services, locality planning and place-based working, and within that, looking at how we use local data to inform our priorities, our workforce strategy, uh, service redesign work, uh, reviewing funding allocations and alignment to priorities, reporting savings and efficiencies, and also benchmarking work. So looking at a local government benchmarking framework and how we can measure cost and performance and how we, we look at how those interact with each other. So a number of these are summarised within the recommendations contained within the cover report. 
but colleagues will expand on them further as they present the financial workforce and digital strategies this morning. Members, I also want to take the opportunity to update you on the development of the Council's Programme Management Office. We're at the early stages of this at the moment, but we have recently appointed two members of staff to the team. And so work is now progressing in terms of developing our approach to supporting and embedding project management and benefits realisation across Council services. The team that we have in place will be working with services to provide professional support, guidance and expertise and to add value to the good work that they are doing as we take forward our strategic plan and our finance workforce and digital strategies. As we develop those approaches, we'll take the opportunity to consider how we can better refine and enhance the information presented within the action plan and within other projects and strategies being advanced by our services. Further, and as requested at the June Council meeting, we'll be putting in place regular update reports. We've taken on board the feedback from that meeting that this should be more than once a year, and so we'll seek to report back probably at least four times a year, perhaps aligned to East Yorkshire performs. However, we'll also build in a detailed annual review process as part of our reporting, and we'll of course report back to you with any recommendations. Members, what I hope we'll see reflected in the action plan is the wide range of good work being undertaken by our services to reduce inequality and to make a difference for the communities that we all serve. I hope you'll also see that all important golden threads that external audit talk about running through our strategic framework, supporting and further embedding a strong corporate approach to continuous improvement and also to our commitment to best value and to good governance. So with that, I just want to thank you for your time this morning. I'd confirm that in terms of the strategic plan, I would be asking you to agree recommendations one to five of the cover report. I would also be asking you to approve recommendations 24 to 26, which relate to the programme management office of and future reporting on the strategic action plan. Those are all detailed in pages 70 and 71 of your papers. I'd be very happy to answer any questions and to take on board any feedback, which will of course inform any future reports that we bring back to you. Thank you. Thanks very much, Pauline. Uh, members, I'm going to open it out for discussion, for questions. And that's the part of the strategic plan. Councillor Mackay. Colleen, thank you very much. I think that set the scene very well for the, the suite of papers that come and from the considerable change uh, in terms of style and method of working, uh, which is certainly something that I, I'm supportive of. I'm interested in asking some uh, questions in terms of, obviously, each of the services have got their own uh, plans, their own uh, reviews that we we see service reviews coming frequently to us uh, to, to approve those service reviews. Those are clearly linked into their own service improvement plans. So those are things that have been done relatively recently. Uh, and again, I'm not looking to get into details of papers yet to come, but really just to get a sense, when will we begin to see those papers coming back to us, which then align to the changes that this strategic framework actually sets? So that's question one. The next one is, I think it's helpful in terms of the fact that this is coming forward four times a year. Am I right in thinking that that would align with East Ayrshire Performs coming to us? So it would just be the exact route of where that would be coming. Is that coming through Cabinet? Is that coming through Council? Just to have a sense of that. And also just perhaps a bit more comment from you would be helpful, Pauline, at this stage to explain if that is the case what is it that you are hoping within that quarterly reporting? What are we specifically looking for that you have chosen those particular alignments? What are we expected to look for at that stage? Equally, I very much value the opportunity for us to have the opportunity to look at targets. It's just, and key indicators, it's just a sense of what time scale are you prepared to accept perhaps key indicator changes or variances to that? And the reason that I'm asking that is because I'm anticipating that as members become more familiar with this way of working, they will get more 
honed in to thinking, oh my goodness, I wish I had asked for that. I think that's really important from the work that I'm seeing and experiencing. So how adaptive are we able to be in relation to absorbing that difference as people grow and learn through this process? Thank you. So I'm going to let Ian come in in terms of the service plan arrangements and when we're going to update those. Um, in terms of East Ayrshire performs, then um, there's nothing set about that's when we would come alongside it, but that was kind of our thinking that it made sense to lighten up with that kind of performance arrangement. As you know, it currently goes to Cabinet and to Governance and Scrutiny, um, and so we would look to align with whatever arrangements they've put in place. Um, but again, we have nothing set in stone and we'd be happy to discuss that with members if there was a, a preference for a different route. Um, in terms of the quarterly reporting, what we bring back, we'd look to provide updates in terms of some of the bigger work streams that are be taken forward um, and also to identify where we've had any issues flagged up in terms of the, the actions or the activities outlined within the report. So we wouldn't necessarily be able to update on every indicator, for example, because some of those we get annually at the moment, but where we can, we would provide updated information more regularly. Um, in terms of looking at variances and changes, you're right, that's something we'll need to look, discuss with services in detail um, in terms of what their thinking is. And some of that information is there um, in terms of some of the strategies and where we've got that, we've tried to put it in. But we do need to try and set ourselves some, I think, to talk about stretch aims, being a wee bit more ambitious around about how we look at some of those and how we keep track of them. And um, absolutely, we would want to keep this adaptable um, and look at changing it when we come with any regular update reports, if there are things that... Um, change between reports, then we'll come back with recommendations about how we might look at things differently. Um, or if there's anything that members come to us with that they would like to see within it, we would certainly build that in within our next next update reports. Um, I hope that's that's OK, Councillor Mackay. I'll let Ian come in after. Thank you, Pauline. I think that's really helpful to just get that sense of, you know, we're not going to have to, for instance, wait an entire year before we can make some suggestions. So, for for example, and it, it really is only an example, is if we look at the, the community uh, well-being and the key indicators, which are there on page 102 for people looking at pages. We've got male life expectancy and we've got female life expectancy. And then we've got a score on the percentage of adults who say their health is bad or very bad. But another set of indicators that we regularly get through in relation to HIV would be the number of years where people have healthy lives, for, for example. Now, that might be something which gives us a more direct indicator of some of the changes and therefore some of the service plans that we would want to see changes in to actually reflect that and reflect that. And that's merely one example that I'm giving. I don't want to take up people's time today by going through these on an individual basis. But the fact that there would be the opportunity through discussion to put those in, even in a mid-year cycle, as people become more aware of them and see what reporting figures we have, I think it is genuinely healthy and I think it will engage certainly elected members and I'm sure also engage services when they see here are things that we are picking up in the course of our day to day work. So these are things that we think are important and will add to the strategic plan aims. Thanks, Councillor McKay. I'll pick up your first question as well. But just on that last point about healthy life expectancy, of course, we also have the Local Outcomes Improvement Plan, and that's been a, a, a review that we undertook in the last couple of years to reflect some of those uh, other indicators as well that are perhaps in things like the Health and Social Care Strategic Plan. So, so you'll see reference in there to a different approach to how we measure some of that, that as well. But going back to your first point, and Pauline's covered all of your other points, I think, really well. So uh, really just to pick up on that link to service improvement plans and other strategic plans. So uh, very much the intention behind the strategic plan 
was to make that connection between that hierarchy of plans, if you want to call it the community plan, linking to the strategic plan, but informing the service improvement plan. So we will be coming back. We would probably have had in front of members already this year, the annual updates to service improvement plans, but clearly this is significant enough to pause that work to let this be approved by council and elected members. So we will come back probably in the new year, springtime, I reckon, with the new service improvement plans at a midpoint in their tenure. They are three year plans. So we'll come back and you'll see then in that uh, in, in those the, the new iterations of the, the service improvement plans, the reflection on what is now consolidated within the strategic plan. So hopefully that gives you some reassurance that members will see that again. The service improvement plans come back to cabinet. Councillor Mackay, thanks. Thank you. Uh, Leader. Thanks, Provost. Yeah, I, I mean, I, 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 to some degree echo uh, what uh, Maureen's saying there. I actually, I've had page 102 circled there. I, I thought my, uh, my point was going to but I was going to make it another issue, a similar, a similar point. You know, I think it's very, you know, we, we, we tend to at the IGB and other areas, the healthy life expectancy is now becoming more, more and more common, and I think it's a useful indicator, as, as you, as you, as Bonnie suggests. But the, the one the uh, indicator here, in terms of we've been reluctant in the past to, you know, report suicides, and you know it's a very, very sensitive issue. You know that. This is one of the uh, first times I've actually seen you know some statistics that when they're reported fully to council in this way, and it just there's a natural instinct I think to want to prom more you know as a male or female or you know and and, and the causes behind it you know and I, and I see what you know I don't think it'll be any coincidental that the 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 the, the red lines are there right next to uh, alcohol and drug abuse uh, probably a, a common causer of suicide in many cases and it's just to kind of understand that you know, to make the report meaningful and to understand the narrative i'm just you know you're, they're, how, how you know, do we want to report you know we want to see this kind of track through time you know relevant to where we've been as, as an authority in east Ayrshire, or you know not just simply where we are with scotland you know so i think you, like when you put some of these some of these uh, indicators down there, it, asks, it probes all these kind of questions. So uh, it's just to get the, the right balance of enough information where, you know, you, you could you could go into a number of these indicators here and, and look at that and want to kind of probe it that wee bit further. But it's just to get the right balance. Uh, but uh, I, I mean, I think you can have a discussion all of that, that, these kind of issues all on their own. But just look for some kind of comment, uh, promise thanks. You know, thanks. Uh, we're going to ask Eddie to come in, maybe help. Uh, thanks very much, Provost. Actually, you know, what the conversation we're having here is the exact purpose of the strategic plan. That actually we give high level indicators that elected members look at that and say, I want to know more about that. And therefore, we need to go away and drill down more, you know, yeah. about these things. And sometimes it will be as asking, you know, maybe in these instances, the IGIB to come over and do a bit more in-depth work with all the members, not just the four members that are on the IGIB, because there's a lot of detail there that other members don't see. But this, I have to say, the couple of instances we've had is the very purpose of the strategic plan, that folk can see high-level indicators that elected members think on any of the themes. I want to know more about that. And that's when we as officers need to go away and come back and give more. If the giving more means I want you to tweak the indicators that you're actually showing us, I think what Pauline and Ian are saying, that's absolutely fine. This is the council's strategic plan. And if you know how people want to see we're working towards the outcomes is really important that we're able to do that. No, thanks for that, Eddie. I think the leader's finished. Uh, Councillor Cogley. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I've got one general question and then two specific questions. My um, general question is, if we look at the recommendations, recommendation 29 is to note the continuous improvement of our customer journey. Um, and I would quite like to see something specific here in terms of just doing stuff right the first time, because I think we all know it costs It's recommendation 29, so Roman numeral X1X. 
page 71. Have I got my Roman numerals wrong? I'm so sorry, my Latin's not very good. It's recommendation 19 in page 71 to note the continuous improvement of the customer journey, but that relates to the digital strategy we've not heard on yet. Right. Sorry. OK, OK. Well, as, as a point of principle, then, I think the, the, the same thing would apply. I would quite like to see something in terms of getting stuff right the first time round, because it does cost us more if we have to redo a job. Um, so as, as a principle, I would like to see that. Um, my, my second and third questions. My second question is for Linda. Page 91. Uh, the percentage participation rate of young people from uh, SIMDs 1 and 2, and we've seen some improvement here, and I'm assuming this links into key priority 8 um, and SL33 and the forthcoming SL66. Shall I, should, should I let Linda deal with that and then ask my, my next question? Thank you. You were asking for what for that question? So, um, clarification as to how we have managed to achieve that improvement. Thank you. Thank you. Through you, Provost, and um, with that one, you're, you're absolutely right, Councillor Cogley. Um, SL33 and the movement around that is absolutely causing a lot of that, but actually so is the, the joined up partnership working uh, right across all services of the Council in terms of working with, with all the young people, but clearly we're seeing a real bonus coming through here for the young people in the lowest SIMDs, so it's given us information that the current strategies are working and to keep building on those, so you're absolutely right in that, the, the partnership working there and the SL33 work is really paying dividends in that space. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much. No, I'm massively enthusiastic about that. And then my next question, uh, Craig, is for you. Um, the key indicators on page 102. And I don't see anything about smoking. Um, and a number of years ago, we were talking about moving into a tobacco free generation, and that just seems to have slipped from the radar. So perhaps you could tell us if that's going to come back, please. Through you, Provost. So I think the, the indicators and the, the actions that set around about smoking will be particularly relevant to public health. So certainly within the IGIB and the strategic plan that we have in there, there's certainly a number of references to. to um, not, not just smoking, also we're moving into that so the, the, the vaping environment, other areas as such as that as well. So some of that tobacco replacement um, initiatives as well. So that absolutely features through through there. So I think as Eddie and Ian have highlighted before, this this is just this a high level indicators here. So um, the bit round about smoking and tobacco etc. is absolutely captured within the IGIB stuff. So there, there is a certainly a read across in, into there, um, just to give you that reassurance that we've certainly not lost sight of it. It very much is there still as a um, as a priority, as I say, for the health and social care partnership, but particularly for our public health colleagues. Thank you. Well, good points. Sally, would, would you think that part of health, uh, the smoking thing, should maybe come into strategic review? Well, I would be guided by by everybody else here today, but I think it's very, very important. Mm -hmm. um, I guess the danger is that one then starts going down, Do we, if we're including smoking, do we include obesity as well, which both are equally important and both link into the life expectancy. Yep, um, well-being, yeah. Yep, so yep. Um, that's, that's a discussion. I, I think they are yep. very, very important issues. No, no, I Thank agree, you. agree. Thank you. Uh, we've got, sorry, Councillor Stewart, then Councillor Maitland. Hi, everybody. It's on um, page 96. It's, um, it's on the, the decrease of the uptake of free school meals for children in primary and in secondary. Um, Obviously, we're in a cost of living crisis. Will this answer come later on? Is it something today with parents not being able to afford to, um, like, what we're looking at? Like, it's like, why are children not taking up these three school meals? That's that's what I'm I'm basically trying to say. Why are they not taking them up? Are we not pushing it forward enough? Because um, obviously, in the middle of a cost of living crisis, we would want children to have a free school meal and a hot meal. Um, 
within the day. So is, is there a reason why they've decreased? Thanks, uh, Andrew. Thanks, Provost. <clears throat> um, the, we've certainly seen a significant drop off in uptake of, of school meals generally, both free and paid through COVID. Um, and there was a significant number of um, issues in terms of just the, the arrangements that were put in place um, through COVID that seems to have a, a significant impact on that. Um, and the, the COVID management arrangements um, within schools have only kind of finished in, in June this year, but we have seen a, a significant increase um, over the last kind of six months in terms of numbers. Um, and I mean, the, the paper um, later on that we talk around school meals, there is some references in there just around some of the, the activities that were um, putting in place and some of the further work that's happening within the schools um, and across a, a range of, of partners to, to kind of try and um, ensure we increase them as, as much as possible. Um, but clearly, the, the figures um, in um, 19 is also about the, the entitlement um, rather than just the uptake. And again, obviously, we can see more and more children being entitled to free school meals as well. So clearly, everything we can do to maximise those um, taking school meals is, is what we're looking to do. OK, Lee, no, thank you. Councillor Maitland. Hello, sorry to go back to this, but it was... Um... Sally's first point, I, I, I don't understand about the getting it ring, getting things right first time and how it fits into the recommendations. Sorry, I didn't understand that. To you, Provost. I, 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 if Councillor Cogley is alluding to addressing failure demand, that actually, if we don't get things right the first time, it actually takes us a whole lot more work to go back and do it again. I think that's a principle that, that, that we would all you know, sign up to in, in trying to get things right the first time, and therefore we don't repeatedly you know, go over things. I think that's different from continuous improvement, and continuous improvement is sometimes we know a goal we want to get to, and the only way we'll get to it. So, for instance, issues around suicides, et cetera, we would clearly want that to be zero, but we're not going to get there tomorrow, and it's sometimes you need to work towards improvement. But certainly, addressing failure demand is, is something that we would want to do. So, does that is that going to go into the recommendations? Has that been added on? Sorry, I thought Councillor Cogley was saying it's a more general point. Oh, I understand. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Mackay. Very much again, Provost. And it goes on from the fact that. East Ayrshire performs and potentially this would then come back to Cabinet. If that's the route, I'm, I'm comfortable with it. I think an ask that I would make, though, particularly given the early stages of this and the engagement, as, as we can hear of, of members and really wanting to look in, in detail at some of these issues, is that copies of this in, would actually be made available when it is presented to cabinet across the whole membership of council. I think, you know, as a actually as a flagged up email, not just the general, you know, the minutes of cabinet are available for all, but actually as a flag up, I think that would be helpful to embed people into seeing this and seeing the significance and importance of the strategic plan across the council. I hope that that's something that could be given some consideration. And just Councillor Cogley took us to uh, pages 91 and 92. And if I can just again point out some of the fragility of what is actually here, if we look at the levelling up fund, the community renewal fund, the shared prosperity fund, as we know, these are things which happen external to us, which we are able to move forward if these are things that are there. Unfortunately, because of the transitions across the last weeks, we're still in a position that these are not necessarily things that we know that we are going to see moving forward on, which will clearly have an impact against some of our strategic thinking. 
So it's again really just to take the opportunity, Provost, to make that point that with the very best will that everybody in here works towards and takes account of everything, we are living in highly dynamic times and things do change, which will have a direct impact on our strategy. And I think that's something that we have to be aware of and open and aware of at all times. No, thanks, folks. I think we're fully aware of what's going on uh, outside our control. Members, any further questions for uh, Pauline's? No, we're OK. We're going to move on to the second part, uh, and that is Julie is going to speak about the medium term financial strategy. Over to Julie. Thank you, Provost. Good morning, members. Members, next week our external auditors will pre present their last report to the Governance and Scrutiny Committee before the new audit rotation takes place. In this report and reports going back over a decade, this Council is praised for its strong financial governance and sound financial management arrangements. It's been a finding that's been hard won and demonstrates that financial governance is embedded and well established across the Council. The financial strategy before you today sets out the Council's financial journey through to 2027. The Council's strong record of effective financial planning set out at the beginning of the report means that we start this financial journey from a solid foundation. This is especially relevant given the challenges that lie ahead. The strategy itself is split against, across a number of sections and essentially provides the financial envelope from which our priorities are delivered and achieved. Throughout the strategy, you will see the connectivity and alignment not only to the Council's strategic plan, but also to the workforce strategy and the digital strategy, which are also presented today. We note in the financial strategy how the Council will direct spend for the years ahead and at the same time support the Ayrshire Growth Deal and caring for Ayrshire. The objectives of the medium term financial strategy begin on page 125. These are essentially the underlying rules that will support the Council going forward. It's by adhering to these objectives that the Council has had a balanced budget for many years without the need to use reserves. This puts the Council on a firm footing for meeting the challenges in what are unprecedented times. The strategy seeks to set out the financial resources available to achieve national and local priorities, and these begin on page 127. It's important to note the interdependencies that exist between the strategic plan and the financial strategy and how we will deliver the priorities listed in the strategic plan going forward. In preparing the strategy, it's only right that there's commentary on the national outlook, and from page 129, we attempt to set the scene for what will be an uncertain and unpredictable period of time to come. We continue to see the impacts and pressure points arising from the UK's withdrawal from the European Union, compounded, compounded by the sustained war in Europe. Both of these come in the back of COVID-19, where independent assessment calculates that over £370 billion was borrowed by the UK government in fighting the pandemic. In page 130, we see the pressures facing households from rising energy bills and the cost of living crisis. The chart shows the significant movement in volatility in energy prices in the last 18 months and how household energy costs account for a significantly high proportion of CPI inflation. The strategy notes the introduction of the energy price guarantees as a means of support for the next six months. The volatility experienced in the last few months means that attempting to forward project CPI inflation becomes increasingly difficult. What is clear, however, is that high rates of inflation, probably of around about 10% or so, will be with us and households for a significant period of next year. In addition, economic forecasters now believe that increases to interest rates will continue with rates anticipated to peak around 5 to 6% as the Bank of England seeks to bring down inflation. Furthermore, the recent Bank of England report signalled that the UK is now likely to enter recession by the end of this year. The table on page 132 is from the Bank of England Household Survey and shows that households are cutting back on non-essential spend. Over 40% of those surveyed said they would spend less on food and essentials. And members are aware of the recent work undertaken to assist with the cost of living pressures in, in East Ayrshire. The report previously provided by Cabinet saw around £3 million allocated to support families and businesses, and there's an update report later on today's agenda. The cost of living reports recognise that further intervention by the Council may be needed in the months ahead. Members, the, the economic outlook begins on page 133 and sets out a range of factors. 
It's worth noting that the volatility, uncertainty and fiscal shocks being experienced all have a bearing on their funding and consequently on this financial strategy. In this section, we mentioned the public sector grant settlements which were published as part of the Scottish Government's Resource Spending Review. The review was helpful in setting out multi-year funding settlements, but unfortunately shows flat cash for local government for the next three years, with slight increases in 2026-27. Our previous financial strategies operated against a background of low inflation and static interest rates, which meant flat cash settlements were to some extent manageable. However, with inflation now at double digits, a flat cash settlement based on current assumptions means that a grant is estimated to fall in real terms by 7% by 2026-27. The review also signalled a change to assumptions and plans around wider public sector pay. There's an expectation of a, free in to a freeze in total pay bill costs across the public sector and that staffing will return to pre-pandemic levels and this will be picked up in the workforce strategy. However, attempting to reduce the workforce at a time when certain elements, particularly around early years teaching and social care, are set to grow, this will make the Scottish Government's expectation extremely challenging. The current year's pay negotiations led to an offer of 5% being made to staff groups with the SIC intimating their acceptance and the SNCT rejecting the offer and considering next steps. Our pay assumptions for 22-23 contained in the February budget report set aside 2% for pay awards. The 3% difference between our original assumption was funded half by the Scottish Government with the Council required to find the other half. In our case, this equates to £2.6 million. It's extremely unusual for the Council to have an in-year and recurring pressure of this scale materialise halfway through the financial year. And like all other Councils, we are attempting to find ways to mitigate the significant pressure and further updates will be provided as we go through the remainder of the year. The two remaining elements in this section relate to the introduction of the National Care Service and their population projections. In terms of the National Care Service, Table 3 on page 138 sets out the information available in the financial memorandum that accompanied the bill. This shows the scale of the budget transfers that will occur. And more importantly, it shows that there's a potential for 25% of the Council's budget to transfer with over 800 staff leaving the Council. This assumes the best case scenario of only adult social care being incorporated into the National Care Service. Members, we know that this Council and the IGIB submitted a joint response to the consultation setting out how our IGIB works for and delivers for the residents of East Ayrshire. As members would expect, staff in finance and ICT and elsewhere are working on the implications of the National Care Service and how we can safeguard this valued resource. On page 140, we note the population projections provided by the National Records of Scotland. Our population will fall by 1.7% by 2028. The number of households will grow six times slower than the national average and our zero to 64 year old population age groups will fall significantly. Only the over 65 and over 75 year olds are going to increase by 2028. This strategy therefore provides an early warning system to all services of the need to plan and redesign to meet the changing face of East Ayrshire. Members, I have already intimated that the current uncertainty makes trying to calculate the Council's budget gap even more cha challenging than it would normally be. However, based on what we do know and having stress test our assumptions, the tables on page 141 provide details of our assumed budget gap based on a low, medium and high risk scenario. Using the medium risk scenario, we estimate that the Council will have a cumulative budget gap of £39 million by 2026-27 and that the budget gap for next year will be £10 million. <clears throat> I mentioned on ongoing work being undertaken to close the £2.6 million pounds gap in year for 22-23. At this time, we believe that the work that will be undertaken across the Council could mean that we can adjust the gap by £2 million and go forward with a budget gap of £8 million. This has been appointed, apportioned using existing methodology and services are now working on closing an £8 million pound gap for 23-24. We believe at this point that we have done everything we can to arrive at the budget gap figures presented today. However, we recognise that there will be further changes going forward. We now understand that the OPR report scheduled for the end of this month will be delayed until the 17th of November when it will accompany a full autumn statement. Any material changes will be updated to members as part of the budget process. Just as we work in understanding the financial environment and putting those opportunities and pressures into a local, local context, we'd also 
undertake concurrent work on how budget gaps and pressures can be met. It's a practice that stood as well in the past, and this strategy continues that vital work. How we will meet the financial challenges starts on page 143. It recognises firstly that staff costs account for a significant element of our overall expenditure. Service redesigns and the work of services supported by colleagues and people in culture will help not just prepare for the National Care Service, but reshape the Council going forward. The workforce strategy will provide further details on this important work. The Council's digital strategy is also on today's agenda, and we know from the learning over the last few years that there's much more to do in terms of developing a digital strategy that doesn't stop at the walls of Council buildings, but extends throughout our schools, households and our businesses. From past work, we know when services digitise processes, this provides benefits and savings in terms of time and workflow, and it also meets the needs of those who expect us to have an effective online presence. Members, in this section, we also make note of the work undertaken by the Local Government Benchmarking Framework, and this Council played a key role in its establishment. The framework provides a national assessment across all councils, but more importantly, allows for detailed analysis of similar type councils across family groupings. It's proposed that the project, the Programme Management Office, supported by Finance and ICT and Velvet Services, undertake a review of costs and performance and report back to Council on areas where costs can be reduced or performance increased. The scale of the challenges facing the Council is significant, but we know that services are best placed to identify opportunities and to reduce costs, and this will remain a vital part of, part of the work required. We also know that services will need support to change and to identify options that incur costs today but reduce costs going forward. And the strategy therefore proposes the creation of an early intervention and prevention fund to support services to provide options for consideration. Members, over the past three years, the Chief Financial Officer has presented East Ayrshire Performance and Treasury Management reports to the committee. At various times, he's mentioned the financial challenges being faced by local authorities in England as they sought to maximise commercial activities only for the downturn and the pandemic to dash these plans. Members will also be aware that some councils in England have had to issue notices to cease all non-essential spend and that questions now arise around the going concern of certain parts of local government. While Scotland has not experienced these issues to the same extent, the current and future pressures will undoubtedly cause strain in Council's finances. The strategy notes that a range of financial resilience indicators will be prepared and included as part of the 2023-24 budget. This will provide members with an overview of the financial health of the Council and also inform decision making. Members, in pre preparing the financial strategy, it's only right that we consider the impact of capital finance and the implications of decisions have on the Council's Treasury management position. The capital investment report approved by Council in February highlights a combined general fund and housing revenue account spend of over half a billion pounds between now and 2026-27. The table on page 148 shows that based on our existing plans, debt charges are anticipated to grow substantially by 26-27. This means that a material part of our limited financial resources need to be set aside to pay for debt. The table on page 149 shows capital financing costs as a percentage of our revenue. The creation of the National Care Service and the removal of over £70 million of revenue funding means that this indicator will increase and a larger share of our revenue resource will be spent on debt. Taking these factors into account, it is proposed that a review of the capital programme is undertaken in time for, two, in time for the 22 23 report to Council. Members, as part of the discussions that took place during the pandemic between local government and Scottish government, a financial flexibility was offered as a means to support councils to meet the challenges brought about by the pandemic. The flexibility relates to the debt element of the unity charge that's paid for in our PPP schools. And in the past few weeks, the Scottish Government have provided specific regulation that allows local authorities to make an accounting adjustment to their PPP arrangements. This would see the repayment of the principal element of the debt repaid over the life of the asset rather than the life of the contract. The regulation makes it clear that where a local authority wishes to take this flexibility, it must do so having specific regard to prudent financial management and with the approval of full council. Initial calculations would suggest that a one-off gain of around £20 million would be generated if this flexibility was taken. Finance and ICT colleagues are reviewing the recently published regulation and liaising with our Treasury advisors and directors of finance and will bring a report back to Council in due course. Members, the medium-term financial strategy is a key document for this Council. It sets the financial roadmap for the years ahead and will be the touchstone
Touchstone for Audit Scotland, our new, ed, um, our new external auditors who will join us for the next five years. It sets out the pressures and the opportunities and does so from a base of strong financial management put in place over many years by elected members. The recommendations for Council are shown at paragraph 2 on page 70, and specifically there are, these are recommendations 6 through to 15. Provost, I'm happy to stop and take any questions. Thanks, Julie, for the in-depth uh, report. Members going to open it out. Uh, Councillor Linton. That, thanks, Julie. I mean, there's a lot of information contained in that. I think, for me, the thing that needs urgent ad addressing is, and you, you, you laboured the point, is the, the council share of the, the pay award, the £2.6 million. Pounds. So obviously, um, we've seen from other local authorities that they carry forward the debt. Isn't it really a prudent thing to do? And I think it's really important that we get on top of this so that we don't carry it into 23 24. So it was just really to get an idea of how regularly you'll be reporting back and any progress on and how we, we get that. And, and through you, Provost, and, and thank you for that. And, and I'll maybe take that one because it's a discussion, as you would imagine, it's been raised at the Ritz of Finance, given the, the unusual nature of an in year recurring pressure of that size taking place. I suppose for this council, you know, we, we've been working on, on it for a few, a good few weeks. It's, it's, a, it's a significant sum, it's a material sum. Um, and we're looking at a whole number of options. Um, part of that is, is a windfall that, you know, it, it begs the question that we have to almost pause and wait to see what happens nationally. But the removal of the 1% additional increase to national insurance saves the council £1.3 million a year. We know that's going to come in in November, so we can book some of that money in already on a recurring basis. At the same time, we can see in terms of some of our indicators for our income, um, that um, some of our collection rates are better than, than we had imagined. Uh, and that's relevant coming off the back of the pandemic. And so, again, we are, as Julie touched on, we are stress testing to see whether we can forward book some of that income. But fundamentally, you know, we're talking to colleagues in, in health and social care and elsewhere about uh, the funding formula that, that takes place. But I have to be open with, with, with Council today. Uh, you know, I, I will be... Um, probably coming back to you to, to utilise a part of the uncommitted balance to bridge the gap for this year. Now, that's permitted in terms of the the the, the regulations that we, we we're asking you to set today in terms of that that strategy. But that gives a scale of of the, the challenge that we face. We will, we will hope to close the gap. It's why we've reduced the £10 million gap next year to eight. We, we haven't got £2 million in the bank yet, but that's what we're trying to do is, is whatever possible to almost forward plan and have services trying to close an £8 million gap while we also close our own gap, but at the same time work on that £2.6 million gap that we have in year. As a national issue, it's been raised um, through across the rights of finance and just as Julie touched on with financial resilience, there are some councils who will find uh, it more difficult um, to, to close that gap than, than some others. Okay, yep. thank you. Uh, we'll... Yeah, Ian. I'm just well. I've, I've got the floor. It was just a wee technical question on the, the PPP schools. Obviously, the 30-year repayment contract. What is the the life expectancy of the buildings? Again, through you, Provost. Um, it's it's a really interesting question. Um, I suppose it's 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 for the 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 chief financial officer to evidence prudence to council in terms of deciding and determining, along with colleagues in their estates teams, to establish the useful life of the, the assets of the PPP schools. What we do know from that contract is that it's a 30-year contract due back in 2038. We know that because of, because of the money we pay through the unitary charge, that those schools will be handed back in, in an excellent condition. They will have life left in them. That then begs the question, how long is that life? Now, there are some councils who are going to um, other extremes in terms of their useful life. For our council and our, our, our accounting policy, for that particular class of assets, we, at this point in time, hold them with a useful life of 40 years for accounting purposes. So I, as, as your CFO, I, I'm, be, I'm wedded to the 40 years rather than the 50, 60. And I think there's so much to going to 80, but we'll stick um, on, on the 40. And the, what we're doing with our Treasury advisors is based on that 40 years. But when I, when I have more information, um, I'll certainly mm -hmm. present that to, to, to Council and to you, Council Linton. 
Uh, we've got we've got the leader, then councillor Richardson so far. Leader. That's, thanks, Provost. It was just a small point to make, but an important point. Uh, in terms of the pay negotiations, there's you know ongoing uh, urgent uh, discussion that's taking place at Cosler. And you know, I've been in meetings earlier, uh, earlier today and actually earlier in the week uh, with partners across the country. And hopefully, uh, there'll be a discussion at tomorrow's causal leaders meeting uh, and possibly the convention. But I think it's, it's table for the leaders meeting. And if there's any, you know, I've let members know, uh, just uh, you know, be able to be in a position to, just to give an update because uh, there's been a lot of things activity there this week. And it was just a, a minor point, just in terms of use of uncommitted uh, balances. I think, you know, we're now, I think, amongst probably a minority uh, authorities, if not, just, that are able to they have uncommitted balances that we can use to offset some of the pressures this year. And just like to thank, you know, the uh, head of finance and uh, others involved, just in terms of the print. Uh, Prudent way they've conducted the uh, uh, financial affairs, and just uh, it's uh, this is going to be a key and important time for us, particularly given some of the national uh, economic uh, issues that are addressing. We we'll have to address. Okay, thanks for that, Councillor Richardson. Thanks, Provost. Um, as Joe well knows, I. Um, I like to ask for some clarification and points. And to be fair, I'd like to put in record that the service you get from Joe is unbelievable. I mean, I think he was phoning me back at seven or eight o'clock on Wednesday night to chat about these papers, so that was much appreciated. It's actually a question for Julie though in this one. Um, Julie, it's just the I like to sort of understand what what we're chatting about, and you actually mentioned it in your summary. So it's page one four six point one oh eight when you mentioned that. Um, Local authorities in England that have been under pressure have had to issue S114 notices. What actually is an S114 notice, Julie? Through you, Provost, thank you. Um, essentially, it's when the, the, the Chief Financial Officer of the authority um, halts all spending. Um, it's when councils have reached a, a position when um, the, there's real concern over their levels that they're spending and whether the, the authority is actually financially viable. Right. Okay, so basically they're basically flagging up, like a board of directors would in a private company, they're flagging up the, the point of almost insolvency. Right, okay. Um, and no S114 notices have had to be issued by local authorities to this point in Scotland, to this point, at this, as we speak. Legislation doesn't apply in Scotland. That's, it's that's the difference. It's not to say they're not in a similar position in some parts of Scotland, but the legislation doesn't apply. That's very much for England and Wales. So it's, a, it's an English and Wales thing. Julie, thanks for that. Councillor Mackay. Thank you very much. And uh, Joe, thank you very much for what you have presented here. I'm sure you, like I, wish it was actually better news. It, unfortunately, it is not. It, it, it is grim. Uh, we could sit here all day and make all sorts of party political jibes about it. I don't think that's who we are as East Ayrshire. Uh, I think what we have to do is we have to be pragmatic. We, the dice is, the role of the dice is here. We are the 32 people who are here who have to take the decisions to ensure that what we deliver across East Ayrshire is the very best that is possible against the circumstances that we find ourselves in. Full stop is the only comment that I would want to make on that. Uh, again, I think what you're setting out is you're setting out some principles and ways of operating here. I think some of these are principles that we have seen you do in the past. Uh, and yes, what they have done uh, is ensure, as Councillor Richardson is, is flagging up, that we are not in the situation that what you're presenting to us is that we are facing at this moment in time any risk of insolvency. And, and, and I think, you know, we have to recognise that. Um, one of the elements that you mention in the paper is the establishment of an early intervention and prevention fund. I have looked through the papers. I cannot see any value attached to that. And 
I understand what you're looking to do. I understand where that aligns in relation to service redesign. Uh, we've had things. Please explain to me how you would see that being different from a phrase that some of us know, and that is spend to save. If you, if you want to answer that, then I'll come back. Thank you, and through you, Provost. I think they are similar to some extent, and there isn't a value on it, and that's that's delivered at this point in time. The strategy is noting and asking for Council's approval to create for the creation of, of that fund in, 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 the, in early course. It's then set to me and to others to try and identify funding that we can put against that, and perhaps one of those options will be around the service concessions, but I don't want to preempt that that decision that council will have to make on the merits of its of that specific report but at the same time and as you would expect um we are also working to see um how we could create that fund and put a, put a value on it because it's important i think as we go ahead that we don't just present a strategy that is all bad news because as you touched on and other members have touched on as east Ayrshire, we don't tend to do that we tend to try and, and, and walk through the journey problematic though it may be and so in doing so, um, we, we, we know that we need to give services uh, the tools to support them in the, in the coming years. Um, they have the spend to save option there. They have their own service balances as well. We have a fund that we said some years ago to allow services to, to redesign and to allow a payment of early retirements. But this fund would be different. This fund would be a, 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 an approach where services could come forward to the chief executive myself and say, that um, by giving us half a million pounds today to do this to my service, it may be around that population decline, that I can then make a change that in 18 months or two years time will bring a gain to my budget, a recurring gain to my budget. And so for one off money, I can reshape uh, and produce a, a, an efficiency that, that are, are, are gain within that budget that allows the service to operate differently. And so it's about that very thing. It's about using the tools we have, but recognising as we go forward, there'll be a need to provide other supports to services and to elected members too, to get us through what will be, you know, a five challenging years, but five challenging years where we know for certain that we will have structural change too. And it's and it's trying to weave our way through that and do so against the backdrop of maintaining sound financial management, which we have, as Julie said, is hard one and and you know it's testament to councillors, councillors here and past councillors that we're in the position that we're in. Members, I mean, just for a, a worked example, and I'll, I'll go back a couple of years in this into my, my previous role. Members may recall a number of years ago, we invested an additional quarter of a million pounds in what we called the, the front door service when Anne Margaret was the, the head of service here. So is that I read the very first point of contact when people were looking for social care, there were additional occupational therapists, et cetera, who could actually do that. What that resulted in was people getting support at that point and therefore the need for ongoing social care being less. So after a year, and Margaret was able to pay that quarter of a million pound back into the fund so that we could continue and do other things, but keep that recurring saving, you know, going on within the service. And I suppose one of the most important things is actually people got a really good service out of that. The actual person got a good service. So by investing amounts of money, sometimes we can actually improve what we're doing, make sure we keep going in terms of, you know, the, the opportunities for change, but also, you know, deliver some of the financial things. So, so that that's the example and the idea that we're trying to look at and really open that up to the imagination and the ingenuity of our services to do that. Thank you. Councillor Mackay. Yes, th thank you very much. Uh, again, you know, similar to Councillor Cogley talking about a principle and that is, you know, getting it right first time. So it's not a change to any recommendations, it's just an overall working principle. I suppose one of the you know, principles that I would like some discussion on and, and some response to would be the idea of actually having elected members and having spokespersons uh, more directly involved with some of these things actually as they are developing and actually working alongside officers really as a principle rather than officers exclusively doing all the work and then 
presenting to is the culmination of the work so is that there is actually some more of that shared actually growing this and for example uh, that would be uh, around that idea in this aspect and i think there are others to come in the paper as we go forward in terms of that uh, that sense of early intervention and prevention because i think genuinely we are all in this together and as much as any of us can do to contribute i think is a, a positive thing so i wonder if we could have some consideration of that as a principle either today or at some some further discussion time Absolutely open, you know, for that. You know, we're clearly minded about our different roles. So with elected members, you know, helping us to set that strategy and then passing on to us as, as officers to go in and, and deliver that. So so I think it's maybe a discussion that we take and there are examples already, you know, like where where we, we do that. You know, some of the, the work, you know, in terms of white ribbon and different things like that, where we see elected member involvement, you know, in terms of our you know, children's champion, veterans champion. We we do see examples of that already. But I think it would merit, merit a real discussion so that we could lay down clearly what different roles were within that. And the roles here, you know, you know, we have, you know, sponsors in terms of when you go back to the strategic plan, action plan, because again, recognising that I want the CMT to own the overall priorities, to then get a sponsor within CMT to share that across. So, so that's there. So I think we have already examples of it and i think it's something that we can take you know perhaps in the first instance if you would agree to sound the board to have a wider discussion there across the leadership and then bring back to the to the wider members for that discussion yeah okay uh, just, just a point of order on, yep. on uh, uh, maureen's uh, direction of travel here i mean it's something that joe and i do of weekly meetings to discuss, you know, ongoing events. And I think that's across all cabinet sports So there is at that level input already in place from, you know, the, the, the elected members and that we get to not so much shape, but we can actually have a discussion, you know, without um, the papers actually have been formulated in, in advance of that discussion taking place. So there is a, a process in place currently that allows for uh, the spokespersons to have um, discussion on, you know, policy settings, I would say. And, and, and that's fair, and, and David's right, um, and I, that's what I thought the sounding board was doing in terms of the political leaders. Uh, but, um, Leader? Oh, I mean, it's, a, it's an absolute fair point in terms of, but it's got to be kind of focused, you know, and I think that's something we've tried to do, you know, from the start. You know, we've got cost of living, and I think for me, yeah, that's probably one of the most key Areas we need to focus. We need to, you know, uh, draw on expertise from, uh, you know, from right across officers, right across council councillors, uh, and elsewhere. And be, you know, uh, and have a, you know, a wide range of focus. With some other groups, uh, you know, needs to have that shorter, sharper focus, but equally as productive. You know, so that's something we're very much open to, and uh, have those conversations. So. As, that these these groups can be very much productive uh, in dealing with us, uh, the, the financial issues that we've got in front of us here. No good. Uh, last, David, come in. It was just a thought, Provis, but uh, I wasn't suggesting this has happened at Sounding Board. It was just occurring to me to be helpful that Sounding Board might be a place where such emerging proposals, the early thinking on, such as an early intervention and prevention fund, for an example, that's the kind of thing where uh, if officers have the product and output of their thinking and deliberations, Sounding Board already is there to bring that forward, to get that initial thought and reaction from the group leaders on behalf of the groups and take it from there. If, if there's general satisfaction with what's proposed, there's perhaps nothing else required, building on the fact, as Councillor Linton said, that the portfolio holders are engaged and consulted appropriately at the earlier stage. So I would suggest or put forward to Council to consider that, that, that 
rather than invent something else or create other groups at the moment that uh, it be agreed, noted and agreed that where there are emerging proposals, putting some of the detail to the, the proposals in here just now or flesh and the bones, as we call it, that that could come back to sounding board where we have that flexibility to table things on the, you know, Chatham House rules without prejudice basis to get an honest and open ear and, and response. And if the majority response says that what's been proposed in anything is acceptable, then there's a comfort to move forward. And if there's any concern at the sounding board, then further discussion can ensue as to what other steps might be beneficial in order to improve on what was put to the sounding board if it didn't find favour. Okay, thank you. Uh, Councillor Boyd. Fair enough, but there's four councillors that are independent and we are independent for each other. So how do we get represented at sounding board and how do we get our say? I'll ask the officers to answer, but I could tell you that the very nature you're independent. So it's, it comes down, down to that process that Cosler has introduced. But David will answer. I think we just need to make the distinction. What we're talking about here is the process by which officers go away and work up the detail of things that council have approved in 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 principle for today. We'll take the example of an early intervention and prevention fund. Joe has explained that the detail of that is still to be worked up. The point that was made by Councillor Mackay is we had the members' input to that. You can't have an arrangement where all 32 members are necessarily input into that. But remember what we're saying is that what comes out of that would go to sounding board on an informal basis. It would then always come back to either cabinet or Council and obviously the strategic plan the position has been taken as council. So those who aren't represented at the earlier stage would certainly be here at council to have the same right and opportunity as all other 32 members to, to comment, contribute and either approve or not approve the final product. I think without getting into specifics, if there were specific issues, and I think there has already been examples since May where if there are specific issues where any of the members in the group you refer to, the individuals or the independent, uh, have a particular interest interest or contribution to make, then a ways are already devised and in place to allow that to be make contribution to be sought and captured. And, and I think you've been involved in some matters yourself, Councillor Boyd. So we can't have an arrangement where every councillor has the opportunity to contribute to everything when it's in process. But what we have is a reasonable arrangement whereby uh, those, those at sounding board can, can at least give some feedback. But the final say comes to council where all members still will always have the opportunity to participate. Uh, other than that, all I can say is, is that the, the the composition of sounding board is a matter that's already been agreed by council. Okay, members, um, that was the financial aspect of today's discussion. Are there any other further questions, comments on that item? If not, I'm proposing we move on to the next item. And that is uh, East Ayrshire Council Workforce Strategy 22 to 27. And I'm going to hand over to Donna to speak to this report and then uh, we'll take questions. Donna. Thank you, Provost. Good morning, councillors. Um, I'm going to take you through the workforce strategy um, for the council, which is um, sets out how we um, want to shape our workforce over the next five years. Um, it starts at page 157 in terms of your papers. Um, and starts off by providing um, a context in terms of the council's strategic plan and financial strategy and how the workforce will support the achievement of the council's strategic priorities. It highlights the themes particularly relevant to our workforce, um, building a fairer economy, tackling poverty and inequality and financial sustainability and resilience. It talks about the service improvement plans, which have already been mentioned, um, created by services, and that we will need to look at the workforce plans detailed within them to identify future workforce needs, to ensure that we have the skilled workforce to meet the service and council strategic priorities. At page uh, 159 to 165, it talks about the progress that we have, we have made with the 2019 to 22 workforce plan under the key areas of work that were identified at that time. Um, for example, work around our employment framework, uh, the service redesigns which were progressed, the review of our pre and grading structure and work around the development of a young workforce and the development of the face framework and succession planning. The work 
uh, detailed highlights that we, we achieved a great deal during that period, despite the COVID pandemic, and some of those key areas of work are highlighted within this section. So in respect of our employment framework, we developed a range of workforce planning tools, including the development of a career change pathway to allow existing employees to retrain in new areas of work. Um, we developed enhanced pension options to support early departure from the council um, and the development of our recruitment monitoring mechanisms through the workforce review group, as well as reviewing and updating a range of employment policies. A particular example is provided at paragraphs 22 to 24 um, in this section in respect of our approach to hybrid and smarter working with the development of the four work, work styles detailed. Um, this was came from a range of consultation with employees and managers with these work styles being incorporated into our, our flexible working policy. Another element detailed at paragraph 25 was the establishment of the apprenticeship framework with work completed to raise a minimum rate of pay for modern apprentices, thereby helping to break down barriers for some young people um, wanting to move into training and work with the council. Part of our work around service redesign was identifying and developing workforce planning tools um, that would support services with the changes that they needed to implement. And this was linked in with our FACE framework and the development of the flexible, approachable, caring and empowered culture across our workforce. At paragraph 30, it details the development of flexible and empowered teams in some areas of our council and how this uh, approach will be expanded on through this workforce strategy. The pay and grading structure review is detailed at page 34 and th uh, paragraphs 34 and 35 and saw the introduction of an improved starting rate of pay for our lowest paid employees to above the Scottish living wage rate. And with the new pay award um, that's been discussed, the starting rate, rate will increase again to 11.25 per hour. Um, it's anticipated that these higher rates of pay, along with the range of council benefits we offer, will help us to attract and retain some of our future workforce. In terms of developing a young workforce, um, which includes the apprenticeship framework previously mentioned, along with a range of other work that we completed over the life of the plan, in particular at paragraph 41, it details the jobs and training investment um, to create up to 200 apprenticeships and graduate intern roles across the council, as well as providing support to local businesses. And as you will know, work is well underway in this area. Investing in young people will boost employment opportunities and have a positive impact on our local economy. At paragraph 43, it details our young workforce equates to 5% of the total council workforce, while people aged 45 and over equates to 51% of the council. And accordingly, as part of this workforce strategy and action plan, we will need to gain a better understanding of motivating factors for younger versus older employees. Um, paragraphs 46 to 53 um, talks about workforce development and phase framework and succession planning and the development of the phase framework helped us to change our council's culture to be more flexible in the way we work, resulting in greater collaboration and partnership with this approach becoming vital during the pandemic and this flexibility will continue to be needed as we move through the current economic and financial climate. Um, at pages 165 to 170, we cover the external and internal influences that require to be taken account of in the development of the direction of travel for our workforce and includes areas such as the economic recovery, financial sustainability, um, our work around digital, digital technology and climate change. Um, in paragraphs 54 to 60, it talks about at the economic climate with cost of living crisis having a major impact across our communities and businesses and therefore we need our workforce to work with communities and partners to tackle the effects of poverty. And this will be done in a range of ways including people having good quality homes to live in and that children in school are receiving good quality food which will support their ability to concentrate and learn. We also know that there has already been a range of industrial action from across various workforce sectors at a national level. 
And that is likely to continue as household costs continue to outstrip pay. And therefore, we need to work collaboratively with Scottish Government elected members and trade unions to ensure we tackle the effects of financial pressures faced. Um, and as you know, work's already underway in that respect. Um, the recent establishment of the Cost of Living uh, Officers Group and the development of uh, a range of key actions is one element of support <laughs> around this area. In terms of financial, financial sustainability, discussed at paragraph 62 to 68, it talks about the Council's financial strategy and how the Council has identified an estimated £39 million um, pounds gap in funding by 2026 to 27, and how, as a result of this, services will require further structural review over the coming years. And as stated in paragraph 64, we need to identify areas of workforce reduction or workforce migration, potentially with people needing to adapt, change jobs, learn new skills to support the service priorities for the future. And the workforce planning tools services have available um, must be able to support flexibility, change and reduction to support the achievement of the savings required over the next five years. At paragraph 68, services uh, it details that services will require to identify areas of work considered essential in terms of our statutory responsibility, as well as considering roles linked to early intervention and prevention, as has already been discussed, to ensure we are minimising financial costs in the future and balancing risk in respect of financial support for preventative services. Workforce will be linked to our digital and climate change strategies, and these are discussed at paragraph 69 to 75, includes, and includes a requirement to focus on digital training for staff, modernisation of services to incorporate the use of digital technology, and how we use technology to communicate and transact with our customers um, and our workforce. The climate change strategy focuses on the investments required in identifying new and emerging skills and career pathways to support the understanding of the challenges faced in terms of climate change and the Council's commitment to net zero. At paragraph 76, it highlights that uh, as the largest employer within East Ayrshire and with 75% of our employees living in the local authority area, we are a substantial contributor to the Community Wealth Building Fair Work Pillar and through our procurement services are actively encouraging local businesses we contract with to become real living wage employers. At pages 171 to 172, we consider the legislative and political influences, um, and these are considered in detail between paragraphs 80 and 92. At paragraph 81, it highlights that Scottish Government plans to introduce significant changes to functions delivered uh, either in full or in part by local authorities. It gives an example um, in relation to the establishment of a Scottish veterinary service, which would have implications for environmental health and trading standards service. Um, while we already know that work is underway for the establishment of a national care service, paragraphs 84 to 86 highlights what this will mean for the future structure of the Council, and that's already been touched on in terms of the financial strategy, as well as implications for terms and conditions of at least 800 employees, 95% of which are female, if they transfer to an external provider. It will also have implications for the Council's pay gap, with further pay modelling being required. At paragraph 88, it highlights that the workforce strategy must take account of the impact of costs in relation to pay awards, the impact of structural changes, identifying the need for growth in some areas while others retract as a result of the financial constraints placed on public services. As discussed within the financial strategy, there will be a requirement for services to focus on the essential services that are required to deliver the Council priorities, as well as identifying those areas of work which are preventative, with investment required to reduce costs in the futures, and services identifying the critical skills required to achieve those priorities, and making use of our succession planning uh, tools there um, when we can. 
So page 173 to 179 uh, provides a snapshot of the workforce profile at the 1st of July, and it covers areas such as headcount, how we use our bank staff, turnover for the council, equality monitoring information such as age, gender, ethnicity and our disability profile. Um, specifically, I would highlight that over the three years since the last workforce plan, the council headcount has grown by 6%. And paragraph 94 details the reasons for this. So it's related to early years expansion, impacting on both practitioners and also our catering and support services, the expansion of social care and growth of teachers um, due to a range of temporary funding measures. Um, at paragraph 101, it details our turnover of staff at the 1st of July, which was 8.53 per 3, 8 percent, higher than any of the previous years. As part of the Workforce Strategy Action Plan, we will do um, detailed work to understand the reasons people leave and review our employment framework accordingly. Paragraph 105 highlights that services will require to identify the essential workforce groups where we need stability and growth or where it's been identified that they will support early intervention and prevention. And we must identify suitable turnover levels for services, supporting them to forecast what they need in terms of workforce to remain stable and identify areas of growth or reduction in the future. In respect of age, at paragraph 109, it details that 51% of the workforce are age 45 and over, with particular pockets of the workforce identified where the age profile is particularly high. For example, 35% of the workforce within communities and economy are 55 and over, and it's a similar picture within the Health and Social Care Partnership. This highlights a real concern for the Council um, as a large proportion of the work carried out within these services is our frontline essential services and therefore needs to be a real focus in these areas to grow a younger workforce and invest in career planning and development. At paragraphs 111, um, and 112, it looks at the gender makeup of the council, with 74.6% 74, 74 um, being female. And Table 6 uh, at paragraph 112 shows that the highest concentration of female employees are working in our lowest paid jobs. The work done to date on our pay structure has meant we've been able to reduce our pay gap slightly by increasing the rates of pay for all employees working in the lowest paid jobs. However, with the potential movement of a large portion of female workers to an external care service, this will have further implications for our pay and grading structure, which will require further review as part of the Workforce Strategy Action Plan. We know that there are currently workforce challenges around recruitment, workforce wellbeing, resilience and development, and some of these are detailed in paragraphs 120 to 133. Um, for example, we know nationally that there have been shortages in HGV drivers, social care, uh, recruitment has been difficult, and hospitality, as well as more locally difficulty in recruiting in roles such as accountancy, engineering and regulatory services. We need to look at pathways into employment as well as identifying clear career pathways for our um, existing employees once in employment, supported by skill development and both formal and informal training and support. At page 180, it details that during the first quarter of 2022, the top reason for absence was personal stress, with over 1,000 days lost each month in that quarter for this reason. Therefore, we, we know, we already know, and we must um, focus on well-being of our staff needs to be a key, key priority, and we need to continue to work to support staff to build resilience and coping strategies so that they're able to work to the best of their abilities and continue to support the great work that they do in our communities. In terms of workforce development discussed at paragraphs 129 to 133, we need to better st understand our workforce learning and development needs and work is underway to scope out a new virtual learning platform wh which will support this area of work. 
So moving on to the final and the most important area, it's about delivering our workforce strategy, and that's covered in pages 181 to 189. This is what we need to do to deliver the strategy and links into the identified areas of the Council's corporate strategy. A key area is our investment in young people and, and future skills, and paragraph 135 sets out how through continuing to pay above the real living wage and by encouraging local businesses to do the same, we hope to build a fair, strong and sustainable economy. At paragraphs 136 to 141, it details the work that is underway around growing our apprenticeship and graduate intern offering and the creation of meaningful work and training opportunities for young people over the next three years. And the establishment of a workforce and future skills team will help drive forward the expansion of this area. Working with schools, colleges and employability partners will be key to promoting the range of career pathways and the routes that young people can access to gain work and training. Another key area of focus to support delivery of the workforce strategy continues to be around elements of our employment framework. And um, at paragraphs 142, it highlights the continued use of tools to support services with their remodelling in line with financial and strategic plans. Equalities will be a key focus as we try to break down barriers to employment for minority groups and we'll review our policies to ensure there's no unintended bias within them and that they support all employees to be treated fairly in the workplace. Another key area within this is the Equally Safe programme with the Council working towards the Bronze Award at present. Addressing gender inequality in the workplace is a fundamental step in addressing violence against women. Paragraphs 144 highlights that we have 74% of our workforce being female um, and work in low, low paid or part time roles. As mentioned earlier, we will need to review, do a further review of their pay and grading structure to look at grades six and above. However, this cannot take place until um, further reviews of services um, have and, and we have a better understanding of the types of roles and skills that services will need in the future. Um, employee benefits is another area that we are working on and will continue to expand our work in this area. People and Culture Service are continually looking at ways to enhance the benefits that we offer as a council, um, as this will support our recruitment and retention of key skills in the future. And paragraph 149 talks about the VivUp app that's now in place with the platform providing lifestyle savings and hosting a variety of salary sacrifice schemes. As part of the ongoing development of this platform, we will look to explore benefits and discounts with local businesses. Paragraph 150 talks about what we are looking at in terms of supporting families um, of our workforce should the worst happen. Um, i.e. a death in service. And paragraphs 153 to 161 covers what we need to do in terms of workforce to support the financial sustainability of the council, making us more resilient and flexible to change and work with our communities. And at paragraphs 157, it highlights that the recent survey completed by heads of service had begun the process of considering future skills needs and gaps. However, this was completed by services before the current cost of living crisis or details of the savings highlighted with, within the financial strategy. And therefore, we know that much more detailed projection and analysis work will be required when the first, within the first year of the action plan. In terms of employee development and our people strategy, this is covered at paragraphs 162 to 165. We know that not all employment and career pathway decisions are as a result of pay alone, and that there are a range of other factors that influence employee decisions to stay loyal to an organisation or to be motivated and committed at work. Workforce development is identified as a key area that needs to have focus, particularly within the ever-changing technological and transformational environment that we continually find ourselves in at the moment. Paragraphs 164 details how workforce development must be central to what we do as an organisation to support our employees. It talks about four key goals of the employee development framework consisting of transform, empower, 
attract and retain and motivate and engage with elements such as building capacity through the use of succession planning, identifying critical skills, providing access to coaching and leadership programmes. Um, and we want to create a positive and supportive employment culture, which values and recognises employees. And we want to provide clear career opportunities. Another area is employee engagement and recognition. And paragraph 166 highlights that um, we haven't done a full scale employee attitude survey since 2018. And instead, we have done a number of smaller, more focused surveys at particular points in time, just prior to, during and in the aftermath of the um, COVID pandemic and everyone staying at home. To gauge opinion of our workforce around areas such as communication, well-being and resilience, work styles and technology needs. We've also held think tanks to gauge views on service transformation and policy development. We need over the course of the first year of the plan to consider and develop an appropriate employee engagement mechanism to gain an understanding of the views on the direction of our council services and what they need in terms of workforce support and development. And within that first survey that we issued to heads of service, we asked for their views as well. And that's contained within the, the um, summary document that's attached as an appendix. In terms of wellbeing and resilience, um, as, as mentioned earlier, you know, this is an, an, an area that requires a great deal of focus for the workforce strategy. It's covered by paragraphs 170 to 174, highlights the things that we have in place through our workforce supports, detailing a wide range of tools and supports available for staff. In addition, the People and Culture Service provide counselling support and a range of intervention and support tools through our PAM Assist programme. At paragraphs 173, it details the need to continue to enhance the resilience of our workforce through the delivery of targeted wellbeing support for individuals and teams. And we need to continue to monitor the effectiveness of our support and attendance at work policy and make use of early intervention mechanisms to reduce and prevent absence becoming long term. Um, so those are the key areas of how we want to deliver um, our workforce strategy and our next steps will be the detailed action plan that we need to create. Um, so in terms of the strategic framework document at page 171, in terms of the recommendations, um, members, I'm looking for you to um, consider recommendation 16 and 17, which is about approving the workforce strategy uh, for 2022 to 27 and agree to remit to officers to create the action plan and bring that back. Thank you. Okay, thanks Donna. Uh, members, I'm going to open it out uh, for questions. Councillor Boyd. Thanks Provost and thanks for the detailed report there. Really useful. Um, can we look at page 160, paragraph 23, please? I just want to bring up a few points. That relates to work style, and I'm aware it was um, approved in the last council. Um, I need to be convinced, and I'll give you my reasons why, um, with this work style and working from home. Ten years ago or so, we uh, significantly invested capital funds in offices in command at the Bonded Opera House, particular in Cumnock. Given we've spent that money on them, what is the percentage occupancy of these offices and what's the plans moving forward if we're working from home? Um, a big thing I remember reading at the time, and I did support it, um, these office developments were encouraged to support Cumberland, Cumberland Town Centres, vibrancy, footfall, the lunchtime pound, and you know, we're encouraging cafes, etc. to open. Is that just been forgotten about? And remember, we still have um, the cost of living and businesses are struggling, you know, so when workers aren't in town centres, that is a problem. Another thing, and it's not just East Ayrshire Council working from home, I don't think that has been mentioned very much at all. A third of the population live in their own nowadays, and I guess a number of our employees will live in their own as well. Working from home can create isolation. You know, you might not speak to another person all day or see another person. Zoom, it's got its limits, but coming to your work and mixing and meeting with other people in informal chats, you know, I, th I think that is really helpful to people. So I've got kind of, um, I've got thoughts on that there. And also, 
you know, if we have a cold winter and heating costs, I think increasing, if a really cold winter, well, maybe some of our workers actually be struggling to afford to have the heating on during the day and they might be wanting to come back into their offices more. So um, if we can just have a wee look at these points, um, I've brought forward, thanks. I'll, uh, thanks. Um, I'll uh, respond to some of it and I'll pass to some of my colleagues to, to respond to other areas. In terms of the work styles um, and those four work styles, those were um, came from our workforce. You know, this was based on some of the think tank work that we did, some of the work that we did pre pandemic um, and also during the pandemic. Um, so in terms of the feedback that we received, um, a large portion of our work, of our workforce who were working continually at home did have issues in terms of you know isolation that you've mentioned however the the majority of them felt that um a mix uh, is what would work best and that's the the route that we've gone down with these so there is no absolute 100% home working um there is a, a range of options um and styles that work Best depending on the type the type of service that you work in and the type of role that you carry out, um, and in terms of the the isolation factor that you 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 brought up, yes, that has been uh, issues. And where the, where those issues come up, um, services and managers work with their employees um, to either bring them into the office if that's what works best with them, or come to a solution that works works out best for them in terms of the the workplace, how they work, and the way that they work. Um, and I'll pass over to Andrew. I think previous to, to COVID, we, we were moving towards a kind of smarter working approach. And, and as Donna says, that that very much was based on an engagement with staff and, and actually in, in looking at services and how best they were provided. Um, COVID absolutely accelerated that, both in terms of, of changes in terms of IT and the use of IT, and obviously Paul will pick up some of those points in terms of, of uh, the, the digital strategy. But in terms of, of the office accommodation, um, there's no doubt we are still in that period of, of kind of coming out of those changes around COVID. Um, what we are seeing um, is there is a real mix um, that, that people are looking for. Um, and Clearly, the, the table set out in 23 um, was adjusted to reflect some of, of that um, of those changes. I think there's a difference between um, desk space and offices, I think, is the bit that I think we need to kind of work through um, in terms of our accommodation. As you've said, I think one of the key things and key messages we're seeing from people is that they want to come back to the office to engage with others. They maybe don't necessarily want to sit at a desk and, and work on a computer. So I think looking to change the, the layout of buildings and, and actually um, how we use desk space, how we use meeting spaces, et cetera, how we access Teams meetings. Um, those are all of the things that I think will, will change the use of, of the buildings. Um, and again, we we've not looked to change any kind of formal policy arrangements recently. And again, just to, to I suppose, develop some of those points that you've you've made around cost of living. Um, and again, within all services, there's a variety of um, arrangements that would allow people to come back on a five day basis, on a two day basis or working from home um, in terms of what suits individuals and obviously what suits the service. Um, but clearly, there, there's still quite a bit of um, development in terms of what those final solutions would be over the, the, the coming months and, and I think in the, the next few years um, as, as work styles develop. I just remember it was a key part of the town centre regeneration programmes, you know, um, workers in the town centre, lunchtime pound, going out maybe after their work. Um, I get what the officers are saying there, I totally get it, but I'm really concerned we're losing that, you know, and it's going to have a detrimental effect in uh, our town centres. You know, I just, you know, I know it's not going to change, but I just think it needs to be noted and needs to be considered moving forward with our regeneration strategies. Yeah, fair point. Unfortunately, COVID put the cry bush on a lot of stuff, unfortunately. Uh, sorry, we've got Councillor Linton then, uh, Councillor Mackay, Councillor Richardson, Councillor McMahon and Councillor Maitland. Thanks, thanks, Donna, for an excellent presentation. A lot of detail again contained in that. Um, the delivering our strategy shows that the age of the working population is going to fall by 2028. 
How does this affect the council's funding? I think I maybe need to pass that to Joel. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you, and through your provost, um, the 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 reduction in population will um, ties in to the the indicators that then flow through to to funding levels, and we've discussed that in the in the training session we've had in terms of where the money goes. Um, we don't quite know the full extent of it yet, but we know that from um, that that part that was mentioned earlier around the the the, the zero to fifteen, zero to sixteen year olds, that that's a key driver in terms of funding, particularly because it's school based children. So it's something we're working on. We don't have the full extent of it yet. We'll model it in due course and come back to members. Uh, thanks for that, Councillor Mackay. Thank you very much, Provost. And again, Donna, you know, it, huge, huge and extensive uh, of what we're looking at here, as it should rightly be. We are a significant employer. We are talking about our workforce. Um, you raised issues in terms of community wealth building and what we have to do in relation to procurement. Yesterday, I think Leader and I and Councillor Watts, I think, were, were on a, a session. And what we saw was just how much opportunity there still remains for us to do in ensuring that we adopt the development of community wealth building in terms of our procurement and how much more we could actually do still within East Ayrshire. So that's something, again, it's always good to have that principle highlighted in another dimension. So I value that. Uh, again, clearly part of our workforce is a unionised workforce. So again, if you could give us some outline in terms of what the engagement across this strategy and I suppose I'm looking at you also chief exec in terms of you might want to just make some wider comments about union and workforce engagement across all of the, the suite of papers that we've got here. One of the issues that is often raised as a concern and you do have a table there in terms of bank staff, teaching bank staff and non-teaching bank staff. Uh, it's just the questions that are around in terms of, so what does that mean? Does that mean zero hours contracts for people? And how are we actually looking at that as a strategy overall? Also, when we talk about recruiting in for our staff and when we're looking at career development within council, I think we're looking there. I hope I'm going to hear that those are pools of people that we have to bring in within our recruitment strategy. Um, also, <clears throat> I'm very interested in terms of the information that's there at Appendix 1, and you've explained very thoroughly to us about employee survey and what you have actually done at the moment. Uh, I am very interested in that. Clearly, that has been done prior to this whole suite of papers actually being available for our staff and being available for our staff who would have been surveyed. Um, I would be particularly interested if that survey was to be rerun again, now that all of these papers are in the public domain, would we actually have the same responses in terms of growth and reduction? Because that, I would suggest, is seriously a, an area of significant work that we have to look at in conjunction with the skills of, of people within HR. Thanks, if I can leave it at that at the moment. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so in terms of the unions and our engagement with them, we, uh, as you'll know, we meet uh, every month with our unions uh, through the collective bargaining mechanism and um, workforce planning is on that every month. So we give them regular updates on where we are at, at different points in time uh, in terms of that. Uh, over and above that, um, myself, Joe, um, Paul, 
Eddie um, and Pauline met with all of the trade unions. Um, he spokes people uh, in terms of going over the plans prior to um, council. Um, and we also met with the teaching trade unions as well um, so that they could um, get an overview of the direction of travel um, in terms of workforce, in terms of finance and in terms of the council's direction as a whole. So uh, we had those meetings and they were really constructive, positive meetings. Um, everyone recognises the challenges that um, are ahead of us um, and it felt that everyone wanted to work together um, to, to, to do what we need to do. So, but we will continue to engage throughout, you know, once we've developed our action plan, we'll discuss that with them. Um, and, you know, we'll obviously bring that back to yourselves as well. In terms of bank staff, yes, that is an area that, um, it became particularly highlighted during the pandemic in terms of the we 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 make quite a lot of use of our, our bank staff. We have over a thousand um, additional people working in on on a bank register um, across the authority. Um, not all being used all the time, but they they certainly um, probably most work on a regular basis. Um, so that is a key area that we need to look at and focus on because they don't have the same terms and conditions um, as our um, um, established employee groups. So um, yeah, we need to look closely at that. And um, I take on the point in terms of if we are looking at areas of shortfall in terms of recruitment, etc. That is a, an area that we could we could certainly look at. A lot of people do go on the bank register um, because they are just looking for a few hours. Um, so, yeah, uh, but we're also doing work around the, it's starting to scope out work around the real living hours. Uh, we're obviously accredited for real living wage at the moment, but we're also looking at real living hours. So that um, is for workers who work 16 hours or less. Um, so we're looking at what, what we can do there um, and that would include uh, all of our bank staff uh, in that. But we're just at very early stages of that. So once we know a bit more about it and how what the impact would be in relation to that, uh, we would come back. But certainly that will, will feed into um, a, a, a range of the priorities of the council. In terms of the survey, that the last survey that's at appendix, at appendix one, that was to heads of service only. And it was um, before the the range of papers were issued, um, and I think everyone uh, is in agreement that it will be um, we'll get different responses um, once we look more closely at, at what each service needs to do and what each service's priorities are through their service improvement plans. And I'll pass back. Thank Thanks, Provost. And just building on where Donna is, in terms of our relationships with the, the, the trade unions, uh, first of all, you know, I think it's a very strong relationship. I think if you had asked the trade unions, you know, and, you know, Amanda Lowe, you know, what she leads uh, around that and that engagement uh, that would be there. I suppose some of the examples of that is, you know, around the, they're, they're absolutely integral to some things like our policy review schedules you know our you know job evaluation models even big things with the council like the national care service you know as members will know i you know represent the uh, uh, solace in terms of health and care in scotland and before us or the trade unions done a submission in terms of this we speak to each other so I, i'm fully informed by the trade unions in terms of where that's and with a session here uh, around that so our relationship is very open and honest you know with our trade unions um, I suppose we also likely have a reputation of, you know, trying to make sure we join things up with them. So we've had a number of sessions around cost of living, and we know what that means for our employees. Uh, I believe we're the only council that's actually today for the employees that have actually settled, you know, like their pay claim, they'll get paid their money today, you know, in, in terms of that. For our craft workers and our teachers, clearly, as soon as they, you know, like agree, we will move that, that forward. But the bit about when people have got small things that they've not agreed on, we'll just push forward and we will we will do that. So that general bit about what's our relationships with our trade unions. I think again, Provost, I was with you in here, you know, like with you know some of our uh, our, our suicide, you know, like, um, arrangements and the core to that, 
as a number of our, our trade union activists, you know, particularly in housing asset services that, that are in here and around that. So you can see our relationships with trade unions actually spread wider into our relationships with their employees. Uh, and I think it's something that we need to continue to build on and, and be proud of uh, in doing that. I think it has to be based on honesty. There can't, there can't be discussions that we're having in here at one level and a different discussion with our trade unions, you know, in another level. And I think that's what they recognise they actually hear from us, what we would be speaking to you about too. Just come back and say thank, thank you for both of those. I suppose, you know, a couple couple of things come, come out of that as well. Um, is just again, in terms of our bank staff, what access, and it's just, it doesn't necessarily have to be answered now, but it's just to get a sense of what access to all of these developments that we have and supports that we are putting in place, rightly in my view, in terms of our workforce, does that go across the people who are registered with us as bank staff as well? Or if there are variances, can that be explained to us? At some other point, if that's more difficult, Donna, happy to accept it. And of course, just to recognise the, the points that have been made in terms of the change of uh, demographics and age groups across the council and how we didn't start this from a zero base. There has been very work, good work done by the previous council in relation to the funding that was wisely set aside in terms of the apprenticeships, which Donna has indicated to us, which is setting us in a very good direction of travel and one that certainly we need to accelerate and move forward on. But it is to acknowledge that that work has been done. We didn't start from nowhere. Thank you. Um, in terms of the, the bank staff, they will have, if they are, depending on the area of work that they're in, they will have specific um, development training that they would get before they would be able to go and carry out any of the, the roles. Um, in terms of access to wellbeing support, yes, if they, if they require access to that, then that should definitely be available for them. Thanks for that, Councillor Richardson. Thanks, Prof. Um, it was just to go, go back to Councillor Boyce. You made a fair point um, locally about the, you know, the staff and East Easter Council offices helped out the local economy, uh, lunches, sandwich shops, etc. I get all that. In fact, I think in, at national level, if you look at the, the UK government, I think it was during Boris's time as Prime Minister, but they're all kind of merging into one. I've kind of lost track. There's been that many PMs recently. But I think Boris, when um, Rishi Sunak was still the Chancellor, actually gave the sort of guide um, to the large companies to try and drive their workforce back into the offices. And I'm sure most of the sort of members know that, but I'm not carrying out my council duties. Um, I still work for, I'm not mentioning them by name, but I still work for one of the the largest insurers or wealth managers in the UK. Then my other job, if you like, I only have to go into an office one day a week. Um, and the reason for that is when noises were made about staff having to go in more than one day a week into an office, what they found was that staff turnover shot up because the the workforce out there, if you if you do a job where you can do your job through a laptop now, that type of workforce really expects to be able to work flexibly nowadays. Covid's changed the world of work forever and it's no going back. Um, what I would say is going into the office at least one day a week has got great benefits. It's like, you know, social interaction, it's meeting people, it's being able to chat to a colleague face to face, chatting through a problem, no having to go into Teams or emails or what have you. So that's always going to have a place. But the reason I wanted to have this say at council was my advice to the council would be don't try and drive your employees back into the workplace because what you'll find is they will go for other jobs where they can work flexibly and uh, basically what you'll see is you'll see turnover shoot up if you try if you try and drive people back into the offices and say you've got to come in three four days a week you'll just see the turnover figures go up because they'll go and work somewhere where they can work flexibly that's all i wanted to say yeah working lifestyles have completely changed uh, Leader. Thanks, Provost. It was just uh, basically to continue that point, you know, uh, 
what I was trying to say, you know, uh, there are these changes in your uh, COVID and arm factors have uh, changed the way that people work and uh, digitalization. You know, there's great op opportunities of how we do business. Uh, there's savings in there, and that's the way people want to do business nowadays. But that's not to say that we abandon the town centre first principle and, you know, have those, you know, as Eddie says, those conversations based on honesty, you know, but we, have, we will have excess capacity. Uh, you know, we don't, uh, you know, going back 20 years ago when most of our offices were filled with four drawer filing cabinets, that's just not how our offices are these days. Uh, so never mind the issues with, 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 with the number of human beings there. So I, I think, we've, you know, we've got a great track record in attracting others, the third sector and other businesses. No, uh, and hopefully, other other uh, the retail centre will come with that. Although that's the challenges too. But we must keep, you know, the town centres is the the, the the focus of where we do business. But I think we just need to be that a bit more imaginative, and make them, you know, attractive places to be that folk want to come in, and uh, just think about how we do that and encourage, uh, encourage activities, including wellbeing activities in our town centres where folk will want to come and spend a bit of time uh, either, uh, you know, recreationally or do their, their, their business in a, their town uh, as a hub. Uh, because, you know, uh, human beings with our nature, you know, they're, uh, we're not uh, antisocial, so we just want to uh, tackle issues with, you know, we're well aware of through COVID. Yeah, uh, hold on, hold on, we've got... Um... Councillor McMahon. Thanks, Provis. Uh, Donna, thanks very much for that paper. It was really, really extensive. Uh, for me, in the current cost of living crisis we're in at the moment, uh, that option I would like to think for people that are working from home would have the option to come into a nice warm office after the back of that. Uh, we will never know every individual circumstances and what to face that. Sometimes we might even incur people that maybe can't afford to come into the office but can't heat their home as well. So I'd like to think we could maybe put something in place for that as we go through that. But I think at the forefront of this and more workforce is all about wellbeing. I think we've really got to look after, especially at this time, and I'm not saying we never did it in the past, we obviously did, but coming through the cost of living crisis, then we really need to look after what we're workforcing in their wellbeing. And, and that, that flexibility and choice that they should have is, should continue more saying uh, now than ever. Uh, Picking up again, and it's been picked up on uh, a couple of elected members since around about Graham's comments and rightly to point out that a bit uh, we're office space in the town centres. I mean, I know Cumnock has benefited because the people that were working from home, the wee shops around about their benefit, although the town centres won the benefit, benefit and fair, that, that community wealth building is still there because they were still spending their money, although be it known a town centre, I had the, the privilege of visiting Cutleys along with a few officers and members uh, pre COVID. And we saw how we were going to deliver uh, customer service and through that front face in which we, we, we renovated Johnny Walker Bond to deliver that. However, we were hurt with COVID that changed all that. Digitalisation, we're not touching on that paper yet, has also had a massive impact on how tune centres work and it's, it's how we're going to adapt to that and how our staff I'll be able to adapt to that as well. But my, my main point on the way through this, that, that the well-being, I think, coming through the coastal living crisis where the workforce is really at the forefront and how we can accommodate them. No, thank you. Going to Councillor Maitland. Thank you and thanks very much to the paper for keeping me up to date. You and Amanda, it's been <laughs> it's uh, some paper as somebody just said. So um, a lot of the points I wanted to talk about have been discussed, so bear with me while I just go through this. Um, one thing I'd like to uh, welcome is the Career Change Pathways, and it's one way of trying to keep our staff and to progress them as well. Um, now, another thing is um, the, the flexibility of working we're talking about. You know, that can have a positive as well as a negative impact, of course, on productivity. So it's something we need to keep uh, an eye on also developing the young workforce. Um, it's been great this week. I've met graduate apprenticeships as well as um, some of the apprenticeships. So that's nice to see as well. That should help us um, uh, address some of our age figures. And um, one, th one thing I can't not mention is the eight possibility of losing 800 employees to an external provider just seems like punishment for being a good employer. So I, I just had to get that out there. 
Um, I would also, I mean, going on about the trade unions, the members' offices working group is um, on um, women's health that we discussed earlier that I brought up um, in a previous uh, council. Um, the trade unions offered immediate support on that, so I, I look forward to welcoming them on to our board as partners. Um, the, there's lots of things going on here. The real lives, the real living hours, I think that's the, I don't think this is just a buzzword. I think this is just something um, that we have to offer. And it's something that we know that major employers aren't offering because their staff are having to take benefits because so they're not being offered real living hours. And if that's something we could take the lead on, fantastic. Um, <clears throat> as for the as for the pound in the town, the lunchtime pound, I was one of those <laughs> employers that absolutely welcomed it and it did make an absolute difference. It did. Um, however, you can flip that around. My husband worked in five days in four different towns and during lockdown he stayed here and we spent our money locally. Also, it wasn't just Kilmarnock, as Jim said, you know, some of the smaller towns and villages got to do that. And that's part of all our community wealth building as well. So, yeah, the office space is one. It is one. And when we look at places like Glasgow, we wonder how they're going to survive with so, so many empty properties just now, at least with Kilmarnock. I hope we can manage it size wise. So um, that's me. Thank you very much indeed. Great. Thanks for that. We're going to Councillor Stewart. No, I never had my hand up. That must be a legacy. Sorry. No, that's great, Elaine. Thanks for that. Uh, Councillor Adams. Hey, thank you, Chair. Um, I, it's been highlighted that uh, the base possible scenario is £29 million deficit, uh, and the worst is a £61 million deficit. Um, so, going back to an earlier part of the report that was highlighted that attempting to close the gap without reducing staff costs would be almost impossible. Uh, within this part, Donna, and, and thank you very much for, for the uh, preparation and delivery of the report, uh, highlights on page 185, there must be workforce reduction. Um, now, Councillor Mackay highlighted the appendix, um, and it's just to highlight what are we doing with our senior managers who uh, eight services believe their workforce will grow, five services believe they'll grow in the long term, and no service at all believes that they'll reduce in the next five years. That's a major issue uh, with the problems we've highlighted today. So what are we doing about that just now? Um, I think as highlighted, that survey was uh, done before. Um, the detail of the financial savings um, were available for heads of service and so the next steps will be working with heads of service and senior managers about what, what are the workforce priorities, what are the priorities for the services and what are the workforce that you need for that. So that's the area that I I would be focusing on with services. And yes, it will need to change. And I think that all heads of service are well aware of that now. Um, I'll maybe pass over. I think we need to recognise how proud our managers are of the work that, that they do. So no matter which of our managers we go to, they have a real pride in what they do, they want to develop what they do, they want to be the best they absolutely can be. And so if you go to somebody and say, you know, like, what your, your intentions for the future, they'll tell you that they want to do this and they want to grow uh, and that's what they want to do. I suppose what's happened, you know, in the middle of all that is there's been a big slap of reality to come in in the middle of all that and saying, how do we hold on to that ambition? But we do it within the environment and we've deliberately put the environment, the wider environment at the front of each of these papers, because the papers have to stand alone, you know, in terms of that. And that was why we then come to you as members and saying, so which are priorities? And we got what our priorities, we've talked about what our money is, and that's where we talk about where the service improvement plans now need to adjust to actually fit into the priorities in the financial envelope available. And that's where it all comes together again. So so you're right, and you know, other members have spoken to me as well about this saying these two things don't add up, but they're at a different point in time, you know, to be quite honest. And I think, you know, like for me, it, it reflects that the pride that people have, the ambition that people have in their work and where they would want to go in terms of developing their, their profession. We all would, but we need to do that as a council within an envelope 
and within the priorities set here. So, so that's but that'll be the challenge about how we now look at these service improvement plans that we spoke about earlier and make sure they align, including the more detailed workforce numbers on them, and align that across to you know where we are. There are also big questions about you know like we, we talked about um, earlier community wealth building. There are options about how we choose to deliver services here in, in East Ayrshire and its choices that have been made over many, many years. You know, we know that we choose to deliver our social care services in-house on the whole. Uh, in terms of that, when you deliver them in-house, you know, our social care workers therefore have the same types of terms and conditions as our social workers, our teachers, our housing officers, our office staff, which means they're in the super -and scheme which means as well as what they're paying in, the council pays in 20%. So the unit cost of us doing that is, is much higher, but it's because of the terms and conditions. The same goes for early years. We choose as a council to actually deliver our early year services in-house. And again, our employees get decent terms and conditions. These are on the whole, and the figures have come out, these are local women looking after local families and feeding it. These are the choices, you know, that, that we make as a council in terms of how we deliver our, our services. And they're all the really hard things that are around for us just now to, to do that uh, in terms of considering how we, we go forward. Some of the things within these papers really challenge us as senior managers, and I have to say us as a council, about the core values that we've held and how we deliver these, and they're the types of things that people are having to wrestle with just now, and it isn't easy. And I think that reflects the difference between if you go to people earlier and say, where do you want to go in terms of the future, and now say, well, here's the envelope you need to go to. And, and that's that's the difference, but I absolutely accept there is a real difference there. Oh, thanks, Eddie. Listen, we've got two other speakers want to come in, and then I'm going to pause it there. We're going to go into the final item because uh, this has been the longest discussion yet, and I think a lot of people have been in. So we've got Councillor Richardson, uh, then the leader, and then we'll we'll pass it over uh, and go to the next item. Thanks, Provost. I'll, I'll be very, very brief. It was just a Councillor McMahon and Councillor Maitland. Jim and Claire made a couple of great points there about flexible work, and I was just wanting to come back in. Jim made the point about people maybe wanting to come into an office because they like the personal interaction, or as, where we are just now, they want to come into an office that's nice and warm. Uh, from a council point of view, I would never stop any, any worker that wants to go into an office to work to go in. The point I was making was if you're ever in the position where you're going to stipulate a number of days, I would make it a minimal number of days and then leave it up to the individual to go in as much as they want. Um, the other point um, Claire made, uh, probably the more macro point about uh, office buildings you know, being vacant and empty. I mean, to me, the flexible working is a, a positive thing for the workforce. But it's no all positive because we've all got pension funds and those pension funds, a small percentage average of these pension funds will be invested in property. So obviously if the value of those uh, office blocks, floor space, etc., is fallen, if the rental yield in that space isn't the same as it was, then that hasn't affected everybody's pension. So it's like everything in life. Uh, there's positives and minuses, but um, to me, flexible working has been something uh, good that came out of COVID. Thank you. Uh, leader. Thanks, Jim. I'll just very briefly, I think Eddie's answered most of it. It was just, uh, you know, the, 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 the bit that uh, James, Council Adams has raised, I think I'd noticed it as well, you know, and I think, you know, every every kind of manager would obviously look to see his establishment grow in some way, you know. Uh, so I think that's uh, the challenge for us. Obviously, uh, you know, you want to see some growth, but uh, working within a, a a different financial envelope as we have to through necessity, um, you know, that's uh, other people's hands. Uh, but we still want absolutely want to make some interventions that uh, impact on some of the uh, inequalities that exist in our communities and want to improve, continually to improve our services. So that's a challenge for us, I think. Uh, thanks very much. Thanks, folks. Uh, Donna, just uh, for myself, um, I, I really like to maybe emphasise to all managers that the workforce, uh, I've get, get, it's not a concern. Um, I'm just really interested to make sure uh, the workforce, when we're going into a new type of working, if it's not uh, tools and you're doing a, a constant uh, process job, if it's that type of uh, uh, job where there's different meetings on Zoom or Teams, 
uh, you're not having much time between these meetings because you tend to cram more in. And it's just to get that uh, well-being and mindfulness out there if uh, we could reassure all the workforce that you've got ownership of your own mental health being, mindfulness, well-being, and to have that break. And, and if managers could really grasp that part where somebody needs time out, they need time out. And uh, I think we need, really need to push that to make sure they're okay. I'm delighted with the part about uh, the, the the benefits in terms of... Um, uh, the, the, the example that jumps at me is uh, funeral poverty. And uh, I've been to a few that uh, we've all uh, helped out financially for folk that found themselves at the lower scale. Uh, and these were working people. And uh, they found it difficult. The family found it difficult to pay for the funeral. So I'm really pleased we're looking at things like that. We can't promise anything, but it's really uh, reassuring that we're looking because we don't like anybody in our employment to be in that position. So thanks for that work. Uh, folks, I'm going to uh, move on um, to the last part and then we're going to have a break, if that's okay. So the last part's the digital uh, strategy and that gets that item out the road. So over to Paul. <clears throat> Thank you, Provost. Uh, members, our, our digital strategy reflects the time of seismic change as we respond to the digital evolution that was intensified by the global pandemic. Technology is pervasive now from cradle to grave, and our digital strategy will set out our themes and digital vision, building not only on the lessons learned through the pandemic, but also on the achievements and successes we were delivering pre-pandemic. The strategy is intrinsically linked to the medium-term financial strategy, the workforce strategy, and the council strategic plan. It's not an IT strategy to be delivered by ICT. It's a transforming strategy for all our services and the communities we serve. It must be inclusive, recognising that some of our staff will need support as we transition to an increasingly digital working environment, that not everyone in our communities is digitally literate or wants to be, and therefore we must be conscious not to leave anyone behind. As we redesign our services, we must also remove barriers that prevent interaction for people with disabilities, and to this end, we have already established good communications with the East Ayrshire Equalities Forum. We will use technology to strengthen relationships with our communities, and we will develop a, a digital culture in our workforce, providing them with the tools, skills and confidence to use technology to deliver efficient and effective frontline services. Our strategy has five key themes set out on page 208 of the Strategic Framework Report. Digital customers, digital council, digital services, digital communities and digital culture. Our delivery, princi our delivery principles sorry, are detailed on page 209. And I'll take you through now each of the five um, themes. Digital customers, where we will deliver accessible online services that are simple to use at a time and place that suits our customers, promoting a self-service environment with a digital front door for the council that's open 24-7-365. Even before the pandemic, we were looking at ways to improve our customer service experience with a move where possible to an online environment. The accelerated shift to digital as a result of the pandemic was quite incredible, and the key stats on pages 232 and 233 of the report highlight that shift. For example, we now have over 58,000 customer contact, contact transactions per month. From 3,000 customer accounts pre-pandemic, we now have over 51,000 online accounts. 30% of our transactions are made outside of office hours and customer contact centre handle around 9,000 calls per week. But we're not complacent. We know we still have work to do to meet the needs and demands of our customers. And as we plan our future services, we must engage and consult with our customers and design our services with what they say they want, rather than making assumptions on what they want. We also recognise that we must maintain some traditional routes for those that choose not to or cannot interact with us digitally ensuring that we don't restrict or exclude access to any council service. Pages 212 and 213 of the report set out what we have already done and the actions we propose to do, including the further rationalising of duplicated processes, an expanded customer contact solution that will streamline engagement through telephony, online and video channels, as we redesign face-to-face -face services and innovate towards more service-led digital change. The next theme, Digital Council is our digital first approach. We will ensure that our IT environment is robust and secure to deliver agile and adaptive services. 
And as we increase reliance on digital, we must do so in an environment where our customer data is safe, where our workforce is skilled and confident to embrace new ways of working, and where there is an acknowledgement that cyber defence is the responsibility of us all. We will continue to work with the National Cyber Security Centre. We will follow the recommendations and guidelines issued by the Scottish Government's Cyber Resilience Unit, and we will meet the annual health check obligations to remain compliant with the Public Services Network. Our digital journey started pre-pandemic with the introduction of smarter working. We will continue to invest in IT sensibly across our corporate and curricular estate. We will maximise the investment we have made already in our data centres and ensure a managed transition to the cloud where appropriate. The draft advance and ICT service redesign will be presented to members will show that we plan to create a specific team to lead and support the development of a business plan to migrate our Microsoft estate to Office 365. This will be the Council's biggest commitment to cloud technology so far. Office 365 will support and enhance new ways of working, and we will work with services to support them through the implementation process. In preparation for a move to the cloud, we have already introduced several new technologies, such as the installation of new internet lines and increasing the line speed in existing circuits to cope with the increased bandwidth demand, while all the time enhancing and securing uh, our cyber defence capability. Pages 216 and 17 of the strategic report highlight what we have achieved already, including, for example, a corporate one device policy and using portable technology to connect and communicate with our mobile staff. And in terms of what we will do, we will continue to enhance our digital security, develop digital learning and development opportunities for our staff and implement green initiatives to support the Council's climate change strategy. The next theme is digital services. The digital strategy will see the delivery of council services with a community based focus where our services are designed and developed with input from our communities. We will develop our IT infrastructure to support change going forward and we will work with services to ensure our technology will support their ambitions. Some 60% of our customer accounts were created during the pandemic between April 2020 and March 2021. Our digital payments increased by 30% and as I've already said, 30% of all uh, online transactions now occur outside of normal working hours. And whilst there is an unquestionable demand for digital services, as example in pages 232 to 234 of the report, we must also acknowledge that there are some in our communities who are not literate digitally, either through choice or, or by not having a device, skills or broadband at home. And as digital services are developed, we must not leave anyone behind and that those who are digitally disconnected are not at a disadvantage when it comes to using uh, council services. Examples of where we have already embedded digital and service delivery are detailed in pages 219 to 222 of the report, including the social work management information system, which has provided enhanced information recording and performance monitoring, <clears throat> equipping our HAS staff with mobile technology to receive job lines, and using Chromebooks with language interpretation software to support Ukrainian children and their families. We will continue to work across their services to support their digital ambitions. This will include making use of IoT and artificial intelligence solutions, creating a smart hub for the partnership smart support team to showcase technology that can support people to live independently at home. And where required, we will support elected members who wish to be engaged digitally with their constituents uh, over Microsoft Teams. Our next theme is digital communities. The pandemic was the catalyst for increased online transactions and for families to connect with each other digitally. However, it was also highlighted isolation and inequalities. We need to continue building strong and caring partnerships with our communities to support the vulnerable and those most at need. And as we transform our services, we will support and encourage our communities to become more digitally engaged and included. We will work with the third sector, with voluntary organisations, community groups and other, under, other organisations under the umbrella of the East Ayrshire Digital Access Network, or the DAN. The DAN is considered by the Scottish Government's Digital Citizens Unit to be years ahead of other local authority groups, aiming to promote digital opportunities and training and to signpost individuals, community groups, charities or businesses to organisations who can provide digital devices, digital training, affordable broadband solutions and vital assistance and support in a digital world. The report sets out some examples of community partnership in action on pages 226 and 227. 
And these stairs provide digital infrastructure is essential, whether for business or social purposes. And the strategy will seek uh, us to work with Digital Scotland and the network providers to maximise connectivity and availability. We will support economic growth colleagues by maximising digital opportunities for our businesses and our communities, arising from the regional economic strategy as our council works in partnership with the other Ayrshire authorities. And we will look at how the three million pounds set aside in the Ayrshire growth deal for digital work will support the development of a digital infrastructure. Our last theme is digital culture, how technology and the internet will shape our behaviours and interactions. Digital culture must be recognised as our key theme, the foundation that will underpin all visions and everything we are trying to achieve in our other themes. The strategy seeks to support, lead and encourage greater collaboration, initially across internal services, then moving to external organisations to develop and deliver digitally, to provide effective training for staff that they, in order that they can embrace a digital working environment, to make use of data wisely, safely and securely, and to embrace data analytics to allow us to drive future decision making. Leadership will come from a digital governance board that will provide governance, control and pace and ensures equality and diversity. The board will manage the delivery of the corporate digital agenda with oversight from CNT and will provide, sorry, will drive forward a digital programme. We will aim to become more comfortable with risk and, how, and not be afraid of trying new things while maintaining security at all times to ensure that the new culture of digital first exists within and outside of the Council. We have already developed a number of sector leading online projects highlighted in page 230 of the report, including the recycling booking system and the school enrolment programme. The Learning Academy that has been developed and adapted to include IT security and cyber awareness courses and the recruitment of staff across all services as digital ambassadors who will be key to supporting the rollout of Office 365. So how will we measure progress? The strategy will be con uh, constantly reviewed and updated as programmes and, and projects develop, and we will use existing frameworks to measure and report on progress. Where we can benchmark, we will, and when moving services to an online platform, we will capture and record savings. Members, I hope this strategy demonstrates the digital journey we have been on and how the strategy sets out the next phase of the roadmap for the future. And as we seek your approval to move forward with our strategy, we do so giving you an assurance that we will not deliver digitally to the detriment of the digitally disconnected. The specific recommendations relating to digital strategy are recommendations 18 through to 23 on page 71 of the covering report. And provost colleagues and I are happy to take any questions. Thank you. Thanks very much, Paul. Uh, we have the future uh, questions very quickly. Council Linton. Thank, thanks, Provost, and thank you, Paul. I mean, I think this is an absolute smashing paper. There's a lot to look forward to here. I think this technology really, you know, progresses at a pace. I think it's right that we have this at the heart of all our, our council services. And I welcomed my early discussion I had with yourself and Joe, you know, when we were, you know, going through the, the setting up of this paper. Um, and I think it's easier for the uh, I like to members to imagine how these will affect you know, the council services, but I think it maybe be helpful if we could have a wee bit more discussion on how it will affect uh, the digital communities part and the work with the digital access network. Yep, <clears throat> through you, Provost. I'll maybe ask my colleague James McKee just to come in at this point in time, James, if you're online. For you, Provost. Uh, thank you, Councillor Linton, uh, Linton, for your question. Um, we have something very unique and incredible um, in East Ayrshire to promote digital and data inclusion and equality. And as Paul uh, mentioned in his report, called the, the, the DAN or the East Ayrshire Digital Access Network, the DAN comprises um, of almost 50 local and national organisa organisations representing the public sector, third sectors, business sector, social housing and academia that all share a, a common goal of closing the digital and data divide. And this will be achieved through a collective effort and collaborative approach with our partners. Collectively, the, the, the network uh, has the skills and knowledge, experience and resource to tackle the three main components uh, associated with digital and data ex exclusion. Those are access to devices. So we have local charities and put community works being one who recycle, refurbish, 
old, used, unwanted devices, give them back to communities for those in need who are digitally excluded for free or at low cost. But also through East Ayrshire uh, Library Service, um, we have the, the digital bus along with a, a range of other venues available. The second part is around connectivity, again through the East Ayrshire a library, a East Asia Leisure Trust rather, um, they have access to devices and connectivity. Um, Respite now offer through the National Data Bank access to free SIM cards um, for up to six months. And then the final part of the, the, the third component is around access to skills, confidence building and motivation. And through our vibrant community service, digital champions through the Connecting Scotland programme, Ayrshire College um, and some others, um, that the, those provide, provide a platform um, to enable people to develop their skills, their confidence building and motivation. And we'll, we will be further strengthening our communication and engagement approach um, through the Digital Access Network's delivery plan going forward. A dedicated resource within Finance and ICT will oversee this uh, and drive this work forward with the Digital Access Network there to support our communities. And finally, I just wanted to say that our workforce, um, as, we've, as we've seen in the earlier report, is our greatest asset with 75% of staff living in East Ayrshire and therefore are also our communities. And they can also play a role in spreading the, the, the digital word and helping our, uh, our communities. Thank you, Chair. Thank you very much. Thanks, Jim. Uh, oh, Councillor McMahon. Uh, thanks, Provost. I'm always enthused when I hear James talking about digital technology and uh, the way he presents it. I know he absolutely loves it. I, I, I think in that race, uh, digital technology is by far the fastest service that we're trying to keep up with. Uh, we can't keep up with it, I don't think, as far as everyone else. We are, we are kind of falling behind with that. Uh, one thing I was encouraged to hear in, in during that presentation with Paul, that nobody will be left behind, irrespective of how they are digital literate and under that circumstances whatever prevails there, they will not be left behind. Uh, it would be worthy of me to mention tonight that East Ayrshire Council are up for a, an award for the, uh, through the Chartered Institute of Housing for that application and allocation policy and the advancement of that through the digital process. So I just thought I'd like to just make them aware of it. Thanks very much, Jim. Leader. As promised, I know uh, some good points made earlier. Uh, you know, I mean, who could have predicted, you know, through COVID, the, you know, the, st the stats in page 232, the rate, you know, which people are using, uh, digitalisation, and when you look at, you know, uh, you know millennials do, it's just a, it's a part of life. And, you know, with, with every, everything and every new technology, you just get a wee bit kind of worried, you know, don't try, not try to hold back pro uh, progress, but how do we... we protect not just ourselves from counter fraud, but how do we uh, protect the public from exposure? I mean, I've actually taken a text message from one of my constituents this morning that's been uh, hoodwinked by a, 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 an income tax scam. Uh, so these things are happening, seems to be happening more regularly. It's just how do we prevent, you know, cyber crime itself is getting more, more sophisticated and counter fraud and all these things. How 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 do how are we helping? You, as Jim just said, it's almost impossible to, to to cope with the progress that we're making here. How how we keep on top of this? Thanks, Provost. Um, I'm going to make one point. Uh, leader, then I'll pass on to Ian Aston. So, um, probably in terms of the work that James is doing, the Digital Access Network part of that will be about training our communities in, in, in cyber security. So there is quite a lot of work that the Digital Access Network will take on um, there. I think in terms of the wider question, I'm going to pass on to my colleague Ian Aston, who I believe is also online somewhere. So Ian, if you're online. Yep. Yeah, I'm on. Thanks, Paul. And through you, Provost. Uh, on the on the, the colleague, the council side, we have multiple um, solutions. We have, as Paul mentioned earlier, the cyber awareness courses through LearnPro. We have a new digital solution called MetaCompliance coming in with cyber nanobyte videos to sort of train the workforce up and, and increase the knowledge and the cyber awareness out there. We also have the digital ambassadors spreading the word that James mentioned earlier. And, and we've also got access to this, a new Barclays Digital Wings platform that, that we've got through the DAN, through James. But we're also working with the move to the cloud comes risks. And I was always the, the sort of dark destroyer and I wouldn't move data without having things in place. And we've spent years building walls, castle walls around London Road. 
and now we're being asked to move this data to the cloud. But as Paul has said, digital culture is about embracing change and accepting risk. So we will do so, but we will work with our Microsoft license provider to secure that cloud and secure that platform, make sure that no one can get in apart from us and make sure that we know who's getting in when it is us. So before we move any data online, we will make sure that the security of that platform is as secure, if not more secure than what we currently have here at, at London Road. So we are very wary of security and we will continue to make sure that everything is safe and secure as we move forward digitally. Thank you. Thanks for that. Yeah, reassured us there. We'll know how to get ransom, Ian. <laughs> reassured us there. Uh, Councillor Cogley. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Thank you. And um, Paul and James, thank you very much for, for, for your um, comments about digi digital communities. And just to pursue one particular point in relation to um, it, broadband access, internet access in rural and semi-rural communities, at what point will we, will we be confident in saying that we have got 100 percent uh, broadband access in all the homes within East Ayrshire? Thank you. <coughs> Thanks uh, through you, Chair. Um, I think that the, the R100 programme is due to complete, I think, by the end of 2022 and into 2023 because of legal challenges. I think it's now into 2024. So you're probably stuck in looking at least two years away, um, Councillor um, Cogley. The other problem you have, obviously, is that we're always going to have these harder to reach homes. And I think that's where the challenge is going to be. Um, I, I don't believe you'll probably ever get 100% full fibre broadband into homes. I think what you'll get will be a mixture of other technologies that will get that those harder to reach um, premises. But at this point, the R100 programme is a big driver behind that, but that, that has slipped back significantly just purely because of, of legal challenge when BT were awarded uh, the, the north and south um, uh, slices of, of the pie, if you like, that, that, that came around. So you're probably at least two years away, I think, before we'll get a, a clear picture on when that 100% could be reached. So, so, I mean, I'm not anticipating that we would get um, fibre connection everywhere because I think that's probably just not possible or too expensive, but it's the 4G or the access to 4G or 5G masts um, which then enable uh, broad broadband access. So, two years, yeah. oh, we're, we're confident. Please don't hold me to two years, but I think that's the way it's going. I think the other problem that you have is I think the 2G and 3G networks will be getting turned off probably towards the end of next year as well. So I think the providers have got to recognise that if they're turning things off, they've got to keep on moving forward as well so we don't go back to the old days of having the black spots or the not spots again. So there is there is a challenge. There definitely is a challenge. Thank you. Okay, well, that's, thank you very much. Important point. Uh, Councillor Maitland. Thank you. I thought there was someone ahead of me there. Um, thanks very much for that, Paul, and thanks for James. Um, the digital provision at the start of COVID was a bit like the Wild West. Um, I, we seem to have moved on a lot since then. I just want to say to James, um, we've moved on even further from our getting excited about microwavable digital books. Um, we've gone a lot further than that. What I would like to ask, though, is <clears throat> what remains the obstacles or the barriers to getting people to um, join in with the exclusion, uh, to overcome their exclusion? What remains? Thank you. Who you promised. Um, I think at this point we'll be dead. Well, if we, if we look at the school environment, for example, at the start of the pandemic, where we were concerned about maybe kids not having access to devices and, and, and to, to broadband at home, um, we got around about two and a half thousand devices from Scottish Government at the start of the pandemic to give out to kids that were perhaps were excluded and would have no devices when they were getting sent, get sent home. We didn't need to use all those devices to kids going home with, so we had quite a lot of devices we could then use and populate across the school estate as the kids came back. We also ordered up 500 SIM cards so that if kids had no broadband at home, we could also give them SIM cards as well and we used less than 200 which is probably a good sign so far as the digital poverty is not as bad as what we were, and I'm not saying it's not bad, but it's not as bad as what we were concerned about. Um, I think in our communities now, I think it's going to be the fact that do, will folk pay their broadband bills when they've got other challenges, other financial challenges? So it's about lack of devices now, lack of broadband. Um, these are the challenges you're going to have, apart from maybe like the lack of digital skills as well. So I, I think there's, there is a big... Uh, 
a fair amount of work to get done in communities yet, I think, to bring them on more digitally as well. And, and as part of the cost of living um, response at the moment, we are looking at how we can create perhaps like digital hub areas, where if they have got a device but can't afford to pay the broadband, they can take the device along and just plug it into to the Wi-Fi that's going to be in these digital hubs as well, at least to try and keep that digital connectivity going. Because the last thing you want to do is, is, is to see that gap wider again, and, and people become less digitally engaged because of affordability issues. I wondered if um, it was perhaps an age thing and if um, that's decreasing, the people that were reluctant to take it up. I was just watching Trisha Marwick last night, who's now retired, of course, and she was complaining that Fife Council wouldn't answer their phone. So eventually she sent them an email and they gave her an appointment. She was very pleased with the service, but not after a good long moan. So maybe we should suggest she gets an account at Fife Council as well. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Hogg. Thanks, uh, Provost. My question was also in relation to rural areas, which has been answered um, by, raised by Councillor Cogley. So members will be pleased to know. I don't have a question. <laughs> oh, thanks for that, Jane. Thank you. Leader. Legacy, Jim. Sorry. Great, thanks. Uh, thanks, folks. Um, just for myself, uh, one of the, the banes of my life uh, with complaints is uh, water tobies out in the, the street. I call them tobies. That's your drains, your water drains. And a lot of them sink, a lot of them come loose. Traffic go over them, it's an awful noise for the residents. I'm sure other councillors uh, have had the same. And uh, the new modern technology we've got, every square metre can be mapped. And I spoke to Kevin about this. And it would be great if our residents, because it's up to the resident now to report through a postcode. Sometimes you can't get the, the, the corresponding postcode for that area. So is there some form of application that we can use that could be out in a map on our website to highlight exactly where that broken water toby is so Scottish water can fix it forthwith? Um. <clears throat> <laughs> the, the problem is there is this mapping system, you're right, it's, it's the free word system free you word. can use, so I, I, I've never used it to be honest, right. I know about it, but I will look into it and come back to That's you. very kind. <laughs> Folks, I'm going to ask Councillor Mackay. Does everybody else is to draw us to a close? Uh, the issue here, it's not that I'm not interested in it, I am, and I'm sitting behind Councillor McMahon, who sometimes wonders that I'm not digitally active. I'm sitting with a laptop. I'm sitting with two phones. I'm participating in the meeting. Boy, I'm out of my mind today in technology. Um, but one of the points, again, I made earlier, I'm raising a very specific in relation to this paper, and that is the establishment of the Digital Management Board. We're very fortunate we've got a spokesperson here who's very au fait with digital things. I wonder if it would be appropriate for that spokesperson to be formally part of that Digital Management Board. That's a very fair point, Maureen. I think we'll have that discussion. <laughs> That's 